I do think that spiritual bypass and the ways in which we are engaging it in our own lives personally, like the ways that we are flying into transcendent experience or or identifying as, you know, spiritual, like, oh, everything's this way for a reason, like before we want to actually feel the pain of a given situation. Hi, I'm Kelly Brogan, and you're listening to the Lifestylist Podcast. Okay, back by popular demand today is the one and only, the uncancelable Dr. Kelly Brogan. This is episode 404, Free Your Mind and Your Soul Will Follow, a Liberation Celebration. Our incredible sponsors for this episode are ActivationProducts.com, UpgradedFormulas.com, BlueBlocks.com, and HigherDose.com. And you can find the show notes for this episode at lukestory.com slash kelly, where you will find all of the links and even written transcripts for every word spoken in this epic three-hour conversation. Okay, third-time lifestylist guest Kelly Brogan, MD, is a holistic psychiatrist, author of the New York Times bestselling books, A Mind of Your Own, Own Yourself, the children's book, A Time for Rain, and co-editor of the landmark textbook, Integrative Therapies for Depression. She's also founder of the online healing program Vital Mind Reset and the membership community Vital Life Project. She's well studied too. She completed her psychiatric training and fellowship at NYU Medical Center after graduating from Cornell University Medical College and has a BS from MIT Systems Neuroscience. She specialized in a root cause resolution approach to psychiatric syndromes and symptoms. Kelly has always been a listener favorite and one of the voices of sanity that uh, I and many have referred to over the past two years of medical madness and, frankly, widespread tyranny. So this is perhaps the deepest dive yet in the history of this show in terms of mental, emotional, and spiritual freedom and sovereignty. So if you're into that, you're in the right place. Now, we'd be here in the intro forever if I highlighted each topic discussed, so here's a quick reference for a few of the themes we get into. We, of course, celebrate Kelly's most recent achievement, securing her spot in the disinformation dozen, Kelly's experience throughout the recent evolution of censorship and cancel culture, how she has maintained mental fortitude in the face of relentless public scrutiny. We also explore the liberal slash conservative inversion and freedom versus tyranny, why so many spiritual leaders are falling in line with the COVID-1984 narrative, how we can all stand up to the mob and claim individual sovereignty and self-respect. She also shares her perspective on identity politics and cultural Marxism as a tool of societal control how childhood trauma has played into our culture's response to the pandemic, how to ignore radical leftist internet trolls with grace and compassion, how to take radical responsibility and escape the victim-perpetrator dynamic. We also cover a fascinating debate that most people have never heard of, germ theory versus terrain theory, and the not-so-mysterious case of the missing seasonal flu. We also talk about why some people still prefer to wear masks how little it has to do with the virus, and so much more. As I said, this is uh, really a deep conversation and uh, one that took some time. I mean, there was a lot I wanted to talk to Kelly about, and uh, I think we got just about everything in this episode. So if you're a Kelly Brogan fan or you're new to her work, you are in for a real treat. And since people like myself and Kelly are being increasingly censored on mainstream social media platforms, I highly recommend that you join my Telegram channel. You can find it at lukestory.com telegram. This is where I share the forbidden content that dares to question official narratives presented by the corporate legacy media. Again, you can find that at lukestory.com telegram. And to take it a step further, my weekly newsletter is perhaps the best way for us to stay in touch in the event of a media blackout. You can join me there at lukestory.com slash newsletter. Just enter your name and your best email, and I will get in touch with you every Tuesday when we release a new episode of this show. Okay, let's all take a deep breath and remind ourselves that God, or whatever you perceive to be God, is in control. As Kelly and I navigate the strange and sometimes confusing current human condition. Enjoy the show and share it with a friend who seeks to free themselves from the matrix. Kelly Brogan, here we are, face to face for the first time. So great. It feels impossible to believe that we haven't met. I still can't get over it. Yeah, because we've done two remote podcasts before, right? Yeah, you've been on the show twice. And I mean, right, like time and space are 
illusory to a certain degree. So when you drop in with someone on a Zoom, you know, you're with them, but there's still a time delay and there's a certain, I don't know, lack of sharing that field. I just, yeah, I just, I never, yours were great. And by the way, one of yours, I think it was the last one we did is like in my top five of all time. So thank you for getting me listeners. I might have been been particularly angry that day. (laughs) People are into that. But anyway, so thanks for texting me like, hey, I'm in Austin, let's hang out. So total pleasure. my version of hanging out is putting mics on someone (laughs) and um, strap in and just catching up. But, you know, I'm sure I I have a sense because we just had a preliminary podcast of talking about things that we can't talk about publicly, (laughs) which is always the case uh, or most often the case. But I find like if you and I just went to coffee, we would probably have about the same conversation we're, you know, going to have. Yeah. So here we are. First off, what's new and exciting in your life? What's what's happening that you're (sighs) stoked about in today's strange climate? I'm in um, a very major transition in my life and the darkest tightest squeeze is behind me just by I would say like a month or so and as I'm sure you can relate and everybody knows it's a spiral process right so there's like contractions and expansions and contractions and sometimes the contraction earns the illustrious title of dark night you know and that window that I went through I I'm not alone I know a lot of people who've been through a very challenging moment that I find typically to be characterized by this sense of of letting go of something that you formerly thought would kill you to lose, you know, um, and, and finally getting to the point of recognizing that you can't get what you thought you could get from that place and that you have to let it go or leave. And it's the same, you know, sort of landscape as my my patients I worked with who finally recognized that they couldn't get what they thought they could get from the medical system and they had to leave. And it feels existentially terrifying. I think it's archetypal. Like it's, it's the human journey, you know, and it doesn't matter what your particular loss is, whether it's a relationship or, you know, a family dynamic or a literal loss, like a death or leaving a system or organization. There's this, this sense that you might die because of it. And I went through that. And of course, there's always hidden gifts, you know, and and gems that sort of wash up on the shore of that very rugged terrain. And I'm in the phase of, you know, claiming those, I think. And for me, it's it's looked like a kind of play and a kind of, I don't know, like budding relationship to part of my child self, maybe even parts of my childhood that I didn't have any active dynamic with and and also integrating that into my adult sexuality and sensuality and seems like an unlikely pairing, you know, like a childlike play and adult sensuality. And for whatever reason, that bridge of connection has brought me even simple experiences of, you know, making a dance video or going to a new class or you know, play acting something with my kids that I wouldn't have otherwise bothered with, or I don't know, just bringing a levity to my life experience that uh, I would have experienced as judged by others, but really was my own self-condemnation previously. That feels really um, enlivening. Like it's like a whole new energy and flavor and color has come into my lifescape. And I don't know, I guess it's kind of defined by, I guess, like saying yes to my creative impulses, like all of them. So if I want to make a meme or write an essay, I mean, that's that old hat for me, right? But then if I, if I want to, you know, sing a song, if I want to go to a new class, if I want to, you know, maybe try on a new kind of, I love to dance, try on a new kind of dance or wear a different thing or whatever the creative impulse is, even if it's like I adopted a dove recently, like, you know, like whatever it is, just to to say yes. And for me, that's been a way of showing myself the kind of love that I hope to experience going forward in my life, which is the resolution of my program that I'm too much, right? So if I carry this belief that I'm too much and therefore like to be tolerated rather than embraced or really loved, then I'm probably relating to myself that way, right? And 
So I'm probably smalling and mitigating like whatever this intensity is I bring or my unfiltered like big mouth, you know, or whatever. And yeah, like, you know, I'm going through life that way. And so to resolve that, I think begins with saying yes to my feminine creativity, you know, that impulse that we all have within and not that it's so dualistic or binary, but being my own masculine container that says like, I got you, go do that, make that, create that. And you can be insecure about it or confused or let it swirl around. And and I'm here, you know, I'm here holding this, like it's, it's going to be more than okay. Sometimes I wonder if the dark nights of the soul ever expire, you know what I mean? Like, you know, I I find myself at at times just going, okay, like I've done enough work. (laughs) Really? <laughs> Where's like, my gold star, Devin? Yeah, it's yeah. like, do I got do I have to go through another thing? But but I have to say, and it sounds like you're having this experience that having weathered some pretty gnarly storms as most human beings have, that you mentioned levity. There's mm-hmm. a certain levity present in those struggles that I find to be hopeful. Yeah. You know, like I've had some really gnarly challenges in the 3D world around this house that we're endlessly yeah. renovating and things like that. Quality problem acknowledged, right? There are many people with worse problems than, hey, I bought a really cool house. I'm making it cooler. But as stressed out as I've been and at times as I've allowed that sort of victim mentality to pervade, there's still kind of a lightness to it. Mm-hmm. I'm not taking it that seriously. A, because nothing really is that serious in the long term, right? But B, I know that it's like my perspective on it is that I'm extracting lessons from it that I'm going to be continuing to integrate for the rest of my life. And those are like now part of my tool belt. Ah, when this thing happens, I have a choice. I can take responsibility for how Mm -hmm. I respond or react to it. And therein I find value that lessens the suffering. Absolutely. In the midst of it, right? Because I'm going, hmm, this is very uncomfortable and I might not be able to make myself feel comfortable, but I can extract value from it now rather than after the fact. In five years, I don't have to look back and go, oh, I see why that bad shit happened to me. It was because I was supposed to learn X, Y, and Z lesson, but to actually be able to, to integrate and appreciate the lessons in it, even when one is incredibly uncomfortable. <laughs> it's know? a fine balance. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I wrote in my last book, this phrase that suffering ends where meaning begins. And I didn't actually think, I was like, who, where did I get that from? And I actually, I put it in quotes and searched it, right? To see where I, cause I'm very attributional. I was like humiliated in med school by an attending who like accused me of, accused me, she was accurately, you know, describing that in a presentation. Like I didn't credit her with a study she was doing properly. I know I was totally humiliated and I'm pretty hard to, embarrassed. Like my shame is very deeply (laughs) buried and inaccessible and it just stuck with me. So anyway, I'm very attributionally oriented and I looked this up and the only search results were me and Viktor Frankl. It was like super strange that this idea of meaning making has been with me for some time. And I think the shadow of it is that I, it's a defense for me. It's an intellectual defense, right? So I can get out of the experience of intolerable emotions as soon as I understand why they're happening, right? Like this oh, makes right. sense because, and it it shortens the duration of my time with the emotions that are being served up, right? And obviously we know about emotional alchemy when you sit and you're just co-present with your fear, with your rage, with your shame, with your grief, you just sit with it, you're with it, (laughs) doing nothing, just with it, it shifts, right? So it's maybe it's like a sensation here and then maybe it comes up here and then maybe it drops down here and then it kind of disperses. And then within minutes of this type of storyless practice, it changes. That's That's the etymology of emotion. That's the nature of it. And I find that I I am so, I mean, psychiatrists are very pattern recognition oriented people to begin with. And there's probably many reasons I went into this field, but I find that I'm very good at recognizing the pattern, understanding why this is happening, seeing the sort of grand design, the poetry of it. And I wonder sometimes if that's an escape hatch, you know, because you, you just did what 
a lot of us do. It's like, you're having this experience. It's upsetting, frustrating, challenging, and you're invalidating your experience, like as you're talking about it, right? Because it's like a first world problem or whatever. Yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. Which of course I yeah. would do the same thing probably. Yeah. And the truth is like emotions, I think the truth is emotions are emotions, right? So that's how you're engaging whatever emotions are coming up for you in the 3D. For me, it might be through, you know, this dynamic or this relationship for somebody else, they lost their job and for somebody else, their dog passed, you know? And the situational details, like the circumstances are only relevant in a social hierarchy of who is entitled to pain and suffering, right? And they're not relevant otherwise because the grief or frustration or inadequacy or powerlessness maybe that like could yeah. come up yeah. is probably the same exact visceral experience as what I might encounter, you know, looking at elements of the the current PSYOP or whatever, you know, like it, it doesn't matter really because the emotions are the emotions. And when we try to make sense out of them and justify them, that's what I've, that's a huge thing I've been working on recently is just to understand the ways in which we self betray and we self abandon. And one of the chief ways we do that is to imagine that our emotions require explanation, justification, and a reason to be, right? They have to make sense. Otherwise they're probably wrong. And if you're like me, you were raised to experience your emotions as fundamentally wrong, the problematic, especially that so-called negative emotions. So of course, we're going to find ways to collude with the understanding that our emotions are um, not really meant to be there. So how can we get them gone? <laughs> as soon That's as possible. so interesting. You know, it brings to mind something that I don't know, I just naturally been doing throughout this process because part of it is like okay let me zoom out and see the big picture right which is what i was describing just going ah okay i can see that this has some utility yeah. in my life right and maybe even even beyond that seeing how some things are being brought into my experience because they are asking to be transmuted mm -hmm. there's maybe for me like uh, the inability to advocate for myself and people yeah. please and kind of go along with even though something doesn't feel right mm -hmm. it's been a huge pattern for me for <laughs> reasons that would take you us, and all of us six yeah. hours to explain so there are things that go ah, okay there's insights there but that doesn't negate the emotion so what i've done periodically is just go in my car and just fucking scream, scream. and just get the frustration totally. out because having a rational explanation for it or finding value in the in the journey is there, but that doesn't that doesn't mean that you're not holding it in your body. Absolutely. Right. So that's a that's a really good distinction. I didn't even realize I was doing that until like you just well, explained that. I, I was do, like, hey, good I job, do it Luke. Often. Good job. Good job. So <laughs> find the lesson and get that shit out of you so you can actually move on and not There's be, separate things. I like to yeah. think there's an order of operations. Like because it's like enter, enter through the upset, right? So whatever the hell your upset is, like you're on the grocery line and somebody yells at you for not wearing a mask or you, you know, you lost something important or what doesn't matter. Whatever is the hot spot in your life, literally whatever it is on a Monday is where you enter. And that's why the work is probably never done <laughs> because there's likely if we are in the experience of our body, it's either going to be a felt disturbance, like our heart starts racing. We don't really know what's why we're uncomfortable or it's going to be a, a top-down thought to body kind of experience where we're like, why did you do that? You know, this is unfair. I can't believe this is happening. Right. Like self-talking. Yeah. The, and then the your body gets dialogue. on board. You know, this yeah. is an emergency. Like, uh, you know, I remember from when I was six that the way out of this is to withdraw or avoid or fight and yell or whatever your adaptive strategy is. But if you can stop, literally stop everything you're doing for like 30 seconds to three minutes, I would say, when you first feel that upset and just be with it, like go sit in the bathroom with the door locked or sit in your car and literally just be with it. And sometimes I say to myself, like, I'm here, you know, like I am here with you. And I've learned a lot from, you know, sort of Jungian concepts and practitioners that have carried on his legacy, that to identify the parts of us, right? So 
what is the part of you that is experiencing that upset? And can you engage with that in a kind of dialectic? Can you engage in an experience of co-presence with that part? And in the almost like personification of these different aspects of ourselves, we can understand how the war was always in here. It was never with that outside individual entity circumstance um, trigger. I'm going to take a moment to tell you about how I use marine phytoplankton, the ocean's most nutrient-dense microalgae. It's naturally packed with nutrients that boost your health in a multitude of ways. Its natural antioxidant content reduces oxidative stress, promotes healthy cellular growth and development, and it even boosts cognitive function and mental focus. It's called Oceans Alive from Activation Products, and it's loaded with vitamins, minerals, essential fatty acids, and amino acids. This is a top go-to for me as a brain food. The effects are immediate and reliable. I like to take a dropper full under my tongue right before I dive into any work that requires mental energy. Oceans Alive is literally buzzing with life force that you can feel. It's harvested from pristine growing conditions and grown in a photobioreactor involving only purified seawater, phytoplankton, CO2, and sunlight. This two-strain raw phytoplankton is then stabilized in a trace mineral solution to maintain freshness and maximum bioavailability, which, little clue as to why I like to take it under my tongue. And Activation Products is just an awesome company. They provide you with definitive information, the best quality raw materials, and let you decide for yourself what works. So they don't try to lead or trick you into anything. Rather, they educate and offer primo goods so you can take the lead in creating your own life equity and health. So hit up activationproducts.com now and get some Oceans Alive and use code LUKE for 15% off any product. Now stock up with the code because it's one-time use only. Again, that's activationproducts.com and the one-time code is LUKE. You know, that's interesting as you describe that process. I realized that that's what I do in my relationship, not with, well, it is with my emotions, but my emotions as they pertain to reacting to, say, Allison, last night, <laughs> it's a great example, last night, super late after I got home from hanging out with you and Tara, and I got an email from this landscape design company, and they had all of our 3D renderings, you know, which I've been waiting for, and I'm super excited about. I was like, honey, check this out, and I and I show her, and I think she's going to be like, oh my God, great job, honey. This is beautiful. You crushed it. Like, thanks for putting this together. And she was like, why is the fire pit right there? That's, I need pool space or whatever. You know what I mean? (laughs) And she was just, I mean, honestly, I think she was just tired and it wasn't time to like go into that. She was in a totally different phase of her day or night. And, and so it wasn't a big deal at all, but she got a little fiery and me of the past could have also internally gotten fiery, not know how to hold that. And then now you have like two feminine energies going like, Mm -hmm. you know, so I've just sort of trained myself to breathe and just go, hmm, my heart rate just went up a little bit, right? It's like, oh, I feel, do I feel criticized? Did I not do a good job? And it's just in a few seconds, I'm able to just go, oh, she's kind of tired. And now is not the time to bring this up, you know? It's like something so small, could turn into something so huge if one doesn't have the ability to diffuse that within themselves and just hold space for the other person's experience. And I would I would say you're ready to be with yourself sufficiently where the dynamic the personalization of these kinds of dynamics is not necessary for you, right? right. So you can't do that for yourself when you're not ready to do that for yourself. I mean, I always tell my girls like I can only love you as much as I love myself. And I'm like literally just learning how to do this. So I am, I makes me cry. Like, so sorry. You know, like that. I've only been able to give you what I can give myself, you know? Mm-hmm. And the, I think the reason it makes me want to cry is like that we have this innate sense of like what's possible in terms of connection and that um, exhale, you know, like finally, like, oh, I'm home. I'm okay. I'm safe. Like, this is what I came here to experience is the, the union through the separateness, you know, and, and it's, it's here. And 
sometimes it can feel so far away. And when you have that like cognitive dissonance of like, wow, I don't know how to love. I only know how to control, strategize, manipulate, and try to secure, like build this straw house and hope that nothing blows it down, you know? And when you have the awareness that that's not actually it, but you don't know how yet to experience what you know is possible, that is such an uncomfortable window of life. Um, I would absolutely say that's where I am in my life. And, you know, so so when you're in the experience with Allison and you you take it personally and you feel like, look at all that I just did, my blood, sweat, tears, and my time and energy, and you don't appreciate it, and I can never please you, and you always criticize me, and like, whatever, I'm just, you know, riffing on it. And you're experiencing her as your your bad mommy, right? You're projecting that, you know, parental figure onto her. You need to experience that. It's not a problem. Like you're experiencing that because you're not done with that experience of your bad mommy, right? And you will continue to experience that, whether it's through Allison or, you know, the lady at Costco, you will continue to experience that until the moment when you are ready to recognize that through personal responsibility, through, you know, presence to your own emotional experience and through a real willingness to look at, like a curiosity, right? Like a willingness to look at that aspect of yourself that is your bad mommy, right? It's in you. Yeah. You're yeah. putting it out there. And and to really, you know, take the piss out of owning that, you know, like when we get comfortable with being wrong, what if you were wrong about the fire pit? What if she's right and you actually, did, no, whatever, <laughs> like, okay. You know, yeah. when there isn't this very rigid, you know, good, bad ob- object, like the good, bad split that we're socialized around, when that can relax and you can be yourself and still be wrong and still be bad, for whatever reason, for me, experiencing myself through others as bad, right? Like if people think I'm selfish, um, like that's a big, like a, like it's a criticism of my own, like I'm a recklessly selfish person or whatever, like even publicly, like that I condone selfishness and my work is dangerous because I'm, you know, uh, promoting this like self-absorbed, self-centered worldview where everybody just cares about themselves and they don't wear a mask because, you know, Kelly says, <laughs> like, as if I'm saying this, you know, that you should just do you, like, whatever. I don't care if people think I'm a bad person, that it doesn't get to me. But if people think that I'm wrong, I'd rather die. <laughs> like, for me to be right. And I used to do it through science. That's why I have books with hundreds of scientific references. And I recruited the entire arsenal of, you know, PubMed to validate my worldview. And, and I do it interpersonally through like my inner litigator, you know, like my inner attorney that always has my perspective and all the bullet points about why I'm right. So, you know, if you think about it, probably most of us fall down on one side or the other, but this concept that if we are bad or we are seen and experienced as bad or wrong, that that somehow is is an existential level threat to our beingness is an illusion, right? So when we can get more comfortable experiencing ourselves as wrong or bad, um, something, something eases and we get to experience a fluidity of our own sense of self and our self-concept that is hugely liberating to an extent that no longer distorts our behavior, right? So like if you in that moment could just be with the idea that she actually thinks you did a bad job, not that she thinks this, but maybe she thinks you did a bad job and you, and you made a mistake and you did it wrong, but you actually think you did a good job, right? Like can those coexist? Can she be her own individual having her own individual experience and you also be that? And is there a bridge? And what does that bridge look like? Well, it probably doesn't look like one person winning, right? About a truth or reality. The fire pit is in the wrong place or it's in the right place. It's probably not going to be found through debate about whose narrative is correct. And that's obviously where we get into the realm of like um, empathic bridges and 
you know, attempting to connect through totally disparate realities. And obviously in, in the world scene, I mean, this is the invitation, right? Like how do we, how do we bridge, um, across the divide of realities that are totally non complementary and maybe fundamentally incompatible? What does that look like? And that's why this idea of complementarity is like really interesting to me, uh, because it seems to be a way for, you know, the segregation of domains of expertise and gifts and energies that can coexist without competing directly for primacy or dominance in the same realm. Like how do we organize even society so that, you know, there are these different, um, I don't know, worldviews that coalesce in different arenas. I certainly don't know what it could look like. I mean, I know that if I'm, if I cannot and will not wear a mask, and if I'm in a room with somebody who requires that I do so to feel safe, how can we be in a room together? I can't figure it out. It's like the ultimate riddle, right? Totally. And yet I know that we are meant to be in that room together, um, even if for a time we choose to leave the room, right? Yeah, because how do you reconcile being a quote unquote good person and care about other people, but negate your own sense of feeling unsafe by participating? And right? what your needs are. Yeah. Yeah. My needs are oxygen right. and to be able to express myself through my face and smile and laugh and connect and speak, you know. And interpersonal needs, right? So you, we mm. have bodily needs and and then interpersonally, I mean, for me to to see someone's face covered in this way and all that I've made it mean um, is very painful. I mean, it's it violates a personal need that I have. And so we get into the weeds of like so many dimensions of physical, spiritual, psychological, interpersonal needs that seem impossible to... Um, meet in in the same space and, and time and i think that's part of the gift of this is like really beginning to look at all of these ways we were unready or i'll speak for myself i was unready to to really dive into um to understand the the hidden dimensions of the victim consciousness that that can hide in um entitlement that can hide altruism um, and that can hide in dynamic relationship. I mean, I, like many, think that relationships are how we will, mastering relationships and exploring, you know, the suffering and pain that seems inherent to relational conflict. That's the way out. That's the way to the new world. You know, that's the way um, to this, you know, sort of third path or middle way or whatever you want to call it is going to be through these individual relationships, you know, because I like so many. At the beginning of this two years ago, you know, like saw it coming and not because I'm like clairvoyant because it was well documented on the internet, you know, what these plans were and, and then it was just go time. And, and as soon as, as everything started, I, I felt I had a good understanding of what was happening and it wasn't what we were being told was happening. And so of course I started running my mouth about that. And I spent a good number of months sleeping very minimally, researching very maximally and, and, you know, like sounding the alarm. And um, and then I started to meaning make, right? Like then I started to recognize like, okay, I think the people who are going to get it and see it this way do. And is there much more just like, what really more do I have to say? And I've been very interested in shadow work for many years. And I started to recognize, okay, so if I have issues with, totalitarian, you know, tyrants <laughs> or even hierarchical models, then how am I exercising that in my personal and professional life? And so I started to, you know, like I re-recorded all the videos to my like signature program and I stepped down as CEO of my company and I started to look at, you know, the ways I was like telling my girls to like eat their broccoli and try another bite or like your room is a mess or whatever, you know, just like subtle judgmental comments, that, <laughs> just whatever, like yeah. that, as if I know better what their room should feel like, it's their room, you know, or so I know you, better how they should So you should started be. to examine your own micro tyranny. Exactly. Right. And there wasn't yeah. a ton of it because this has been my jam for a while, right? Is to like 
You know, like I've, I've never punished my children, for example, never. And it was still there. Like there were still subtle ways, you know, that it was active. And then I started to look at all of the incoherent aspects of my lifestyle, you know, and like, you know, the Amazon and my smartphone. Tell and- us about your smartphone because yeah. we're hanging out last night and I looked over and I was like, what is that phone? Because you, <laughs> you mentioned it to me. You're like, yeah, I'm kind of hard to reach because I, <laughs> I have a different kind of phone. And I was like, oh shit, she legit. I mean, it's not a flip phone, but it looks- It's like a hipster flip phone. It's called yeah. a light phone. I'm not L-I- necessarily endorsing it because it kind of- L-I-T-E. In a way. L-I-G-H-T. Oh, okay. Okay. And there's a couple, I have a new one coming soon. Mudita, it's called. But anyway, I- I'm still figuring that out. It's my relationship to technology does not feel coherent yet. Mine either. Yeah. It's hard. I'm, it's ultimate addiction. I mean, I'm yeah. look, you know, I'm looking at the oligarchs, the Jeff Bezos and all these characters, right? And yet, you know, uh, Zuckerberg, I'm live streaming on Facebook and Instagram right, right. now, right? Yeah. And have an iPhone. I order almost everything I need from Amazon. Yeah. You know, so I'm like, ah oh, God, it's this. I don't know. I'm still like dancing with the devil. And I feel like as a person, generally speaking, I have pretty high integrity, at least for for what feels good and integrous for me. But there is a lack of congruence there because there are certain conveniences and, you know, services that I find to be useful. So I find myself rationalizing it. Well, just let's just take like live streaming on Facebook and Instagram, those evil bastards. (laughs) It's like, well, okay, I'm, I'm sort of playing with the other side in their sandbox, yet is the net benefit of my doing Maybe. so yeah. uh, uplifting mankind right. in a more meaningful way? Like, is it going to make a difference to that system, to that beast, if I personally opt out and start advocating for other people to do the same? Like, is that going to serve the greatest good for all creation more so than me just kind of doing my work in a Trojan horse capacity and like, yeah, I'm kind of still in this system and I'm, I'm not trying to be dis- deplatformed and have, you know, no ability to reach people. So is the net, you know, result of that me contributing more positivity and more awakening to yeah. more people, you know, and, and am I able to do so uh, in a, a bigger capacity having a smartphone than if I got myself a light phone and could only text and call people and have no access to apps or whatever, you know? I mean, I've spent a lot of time laboring over this. I'm just keeping it moving, but I'm so staunch about some of my positions and, you know, I've never put the thing up my nose. I'm never, I'm never doing any of that. I'm just, if I have to go somewhere that requires that, I don't go there, you know, it's just, I'm not doing that. It's clear. So there's like hard lines that are just metaphysically non-negotiable for me. But then there's the gray area of yeah. the stuff I'm describing that's kind of like, yeah, I'm still in the swamp a bit, you know? It's like yeah. kind of waiting it out until there's viable alternatives there that can still serve my needs. So yeah, it's, I don't know. Yeah, I would, I, I would say that what you just described, a lot of us have had that inner dialogue of like, well, this and that and balancing and rationalizing. That's the inner attorney, right? Because you're <laughs> totally. on some level, not to like, whatever, put you on the spot, but yeah. You want to feel right about your choice, right? So you're yeah. making sense out of it. So now you can still feel okay about it. I don't think there is an objective, like sovereign lifestyle, right? I don't think there's an objective way to exit the matrix and build this new earth. I think that it is an inside job. If you feel a disturbance, which I did, Actually, it was less about like track and trace and being a part of the machinery of cyborg, you know, humanity. Then it was actually about like the addictive elements of my smartphone. And wait, where's my phone? <laughs> exactly. And when I would find myself, it was really yeah. like one day my my youngest daughter yelled at my other daughter. I used to use this app Voxer or whatever, and and she yelled at her because Sophia, my eldest, was trying to tell me something. And my youngest, Lucia, was like, Sophia, she's voxing. Like, like defend, she was defending my, like, time with my phone against my other daughter's attention. She was justifying your lack of presence. Yes. Right. (laughs) She's voxing. Like, don't bother mama. She's addicted to her phone and we're here to support that. Right. Like, and then I noticed, like, I was like in the bathroom. And like, I never cruised on social media. It was always work addiction. Right. So I was in the bathroom, like, 
answering emails in the bathroom so my kids wouldn't see me on my phone. And that inner disturbance, like that inner sense of what I am doing, like it's an inner integrity, right? It's not like, oh, I'm fighting the man and I'm here with the man on my phone. Right, right. Yes, there's that. I don't think that's the way. Um, I think the way is when you get that whisper inside that says something, um, it's not feel empowered here. Like you're split. Yes. Then yes. just go in, check it out. I mean, when I got, I got off my phone last year and a year ago and you know, I haven't traveled. I haven't gone any, it's been easy. This I have is a your computer. first trip, right? Yeah. 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 I have a computer, right? So like I can do everything, telegram, Instagram, I can do everything on my computer. And there's all these hacks and, you know, I'm not the first one to do this. I wrote like a little ebook on like the way to do it. It's not. Oh, yeah. we'll put that in the show notes. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's if you my send me. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, it's only in the membership. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, we'll put that. Okay. Yeah. We'll put your membership in the, the, the show the notes will be uh, lukestory.com slash Kelly for those listening. So we'll put a link to your courses and where people can find this. Yeah. Stuff. I mean, I was just perusing your site in preparation for the interview and I was like, oh my God, the sheer vastness of all of the free content on there. I mean, I could have, I could have written manuscripts for 20 interviews. You know what I mean? Does urine therapy really work or is it a scam? You know, I was like, I actually want to talk about that because I used to do that and I don't know if it worked, but yeah. So yeah. That... Well, when all this, the censorship stuff started going down, I was like, you know what? I want to be with people who are into this stuff, talking about this together in a walled garden so yeah. that we can all exhale and actually be in the messiness of trying to figure this. So we have this thing called the Sovereignty Series. And it's like, you know, raising your own chickens and growing your own food and, you know, looking at crypto and, and you know, um, digital investments and and then also the smartphone thing. And and it's it's vulnerable, you know, to go into these spaces as a novice and to do that with other like minds who are on the path. It just feels, it just feels better. But yeah, I mean, to me, the most compelling question. I actually was asked this the last time I traveled two years ago. I was on a, I went on a silent retreat with Adya Shanti and, and he asked this question, I think is the most compelling question I've ever been asked. And I, I ask it all the time now, which is, I don't know, I'm paraphrasing, but what do you know about your relationships, about your life, whatever? What do you know that you deeply wish you didn't know? That's it, right? That question puts you in touch with your intuition and your habit of self-betrayal in the same moment. Wow. Right? Because when you said that, my core wound immediately came to mind. Interestingly. Enough. Yeah. And I how, mean, do I really, do I, in a awake, cognizant way, wish I didn't know that? No, but no. fundamentally, you, you know what I mean? You could just go like there's this. A, there's a lot of grist for the mill in that wound, and it's the catalyst for so much evolution. But there is still a part of me that's like, oh, God, I wish that was repressed, you know, because it's something that I won't say so much has to be dealt with, but it's fundamental to who I am and has shaped so much of my life often in the past quite negatively, you know? Yeah. And there's probably concrete examples in your three-dimensional life right now where, where it's really relevant. Right. And so it might be like, oh, I'm, I need to leave this relationship or I'm not showing up for my daughter the way I should, or I need to, I really should stop, you know, drinking, or I really should start eating meat or I really should stop eating meat. I mean, whatever it is, there's a little voice. Start. Out. It's starting. <laughs> Start. <laughs> That's a whole other topic, actually. As one of the great international advocates for red meat eating for the past decade, a year and a half vegetarian now. Are you really? Super confused. Are you feeling okay? Surprisingly, yeah. Um, I actually don't feel. That's any funny because when we planned dinner, I. I knew you as an advocate for red yeah. meat and there's a really great like grass fed meat place yeah, yeah. near here called carve. And I was going to go there because everyone always likes it, but it was far away from where we're yeah. all staying and stuff like that. So we, we got a place with options, but that's interesting. I always it's joke shocking. about that because I was a vegetarian for 10 years and my health suffered um, Absolutely. Ter terribly. Every patient I have ever worked with came to me. I mean, some eating standard American diet, yeah. vegetarian or vegan. 
I mean, I literally was like running a Manhattan-based reform center for vegetarianism. <laughs> and the very basic diet that I promote, it, I mean, it's, it's not like rocket science. It's a red meat forward, I would say, dietary approach. I cannot deny, I mean, I have published literally history-making cases of the resolution of chronic illness. I mean, I, as far as I know, I published the first case on the resolution of Graves' disease through lifestyle medicine ever. Wow. <laughs> right? That's not because it's the only one or the first one. Yeah. But I took the time, you know, to publish it. And, and we have dozens of these. So I know that this approach is game changing. And I couldn't make sense out of the fact, you know, and I had Hashimoto's and I healed myself through, you know, incorporation of, of red meat and obviously elimination of gluten and dairy and other things. But I wasn't meditating. I wasn't exercising. I didn't do anything else. I just changed my diet at the beginning. And yeah, so as a part of this like sovereignty series thing, I started raising uh, chickens and I adopted two cats as we were talking about earlier. And uh, it was, that was the end for me. I never ate meat again. Wow. That's so Shit. interesting. That's so interesting. It was like, it really, it really threw me, you know, because I was, I, I still am. I mean, I'm probably a year and a half in and I don't know what's going to happen to my health. And I did this is certainly not for health reasons. And I started to develop this, I don't know, kind of like ideology around diet where I, I think that um, we borrow the prana, you know, we borrow the energy, we borrow the nutrients, how, whatever dimension you want to look at it through from animals when we need that, you know, and that there are stages of connection to our own, like pranic sourcing, our own, obviously we know there are breatharians in the world. Like obviously we don't need to eat. So there it's way more nuanced than macronutrients and, you know, omega six, three, nine fatty acid. I mean, there's, there's more to the story here. We all know that there's a dimension of, um, consciousness that can be applied to right, our relationship. Right. And that, sustenance. that, that fact is out of generally outside of the conversation of like, what's the best diet? Like, I hate talking about diet. Oh my God. No, I never <laughs> do know, either. I never, the there's diet, no point. You know, cause it's like, but anyway, whether, whether like you can provide data that supports eating whatever or not eating it right outside of that you have you know neem karoli baba you have muktananda you have all, i mean i would think of like the indian saints and sages and they're reported to sometimes not eat not sleep for decades you know yogananda like you hear tom knowles talk about him he's like yeah he would maybe kind of nap for like an hour in the evening and then just awake serving people the whole time right so there have been humans on record that have gotten energy from other sources, yeah. right? And it didn't matter if they were paleo or vegan or carnivore or whatever. Like they're so outside of that because their consciousness is, I don't know, I guess maybe elevated might be the right word or, or tapped in in a certain way that just negates all of that lower level debate on what you actually put in your body. I think the debate is like all of these ways that we recruit science and rational mind to justify our impulse, our feelings, our intuition. It is another form of self-abandonment. I don't need to convince anyone. I don't need to prove to anyone what is aligned for me. And that's why I never entered into the nutrition paleo vegan debate. And I have many vegans who are not fans of mine, for sure. I've, in fact, the most vitriolic emails we've received over the years have been from the vegan community, for well, sure. Well, now they can like you again. <laughs> oh my God, I don't even care who likes me. It doesn't matter. <laughs> but We're going to announce it here, guys. Oh my God. All you vegans and No, that I'm were, not a vegan. I eat my, my chicken's eggs. That you were pissed at Kelly before. She is <laughs> she exonerated. <won't> <laughs> She's now joined your team partially. Right, right, partially. Except for the eggs. Except for the eggs. Yeah, no, but I mean, I think it's again that inner, it's that inner alignment. The my mentor Nick Gonzalez always said, patients will want to eat the diet that heals them. They'll want to eat it. So every time a vegan or vegetarian would sit in my office and I would say, "Listen, here's the diet you're going to do. You don't get a second appointment until you have a month of literally no bullshit, not one moment of cheating, not one molecule of gluten or dairy for one month, and I, you know, and and the rest of it, and I'll see you on the other end." And they would light up like a Christmas tree at the idea of having a burger. Yeah, yeah. I've having, been I've been approached by many people, predominantly females, that are really struggling with 
with being vegan and they're coming to me with kind of permission, you know, because yeah, permission, because they're, they're in that yeah. split. And yeah. my go to is always bone broth. I'm like, hey, like that animal died anyway because people wanted to eat its muscles. So those mm-hmm. bones are just going to be made into dog bones unless mm-hmm. somebody boils them and you drink it, you know, and that usually starts giving people the vitality that they've been lacking enough where they're like, okay, steak. <laughs> you know I mean? So, and my approach was like steak tonight. Oh yeah. Well, <laughs> right? it's yeah. Just no easing in. And I found, I never had to convince anyone. It was, it's huh. this, this meta permission to follow that inner rumble. I don't know. I wish I had a better word than rumble, but that is all I ever provided to anyone. I mean, even Ali Zek that we both, mm-hmm. yeah, who's like a public former patient of mine, an incredible sage on this plane. At this her, her son, Alec. Alec. Yeah. yeah, he's he's in my top three, twi- what do you call it, tweeters. <laughs> you know? he's, he's got great, concise ideas. I, I suck at Twitter and no one listens to me there anyway, but I go on there sometimes and I always look for his. They're great. It's amazing. Their yeah, family is very like, articulate. it's such a gift um, to, to this plane. And, you know, I often talk about how, I mean, her story, she's a published case, but her story is extraordinary. And I encourage anyone to explore, you know, her Phoenix Rising, you know, experience. And all, literally all that I did for her was to look her in the eye and feel deeply in my heart. As I said to her, you're not crazy. <laughs> That's it. That's it's literally it. I mean, this woman was like off and running, (laughs) you know, like that's all she needed to validate that little voice, that little inner knowing that like needed, needed a little like, you know, sort of um, enclave to hold it, needed a little containment. And so, yeah. So when I got that rumble inside, that was like, you're, you're done, you know, eating animals. I tried to make sense out of it, but I think if I continued to do so, then my paleo diet would have become wrong for me, right? And maybe I would have gotten sick uh, as my body attempted to remind me. If it is aligned, which it was for all those years of my recovery, then it's the right one for me, right? So it's just that coherence, coherence. It's getting into a state of, you know, your actions, your words, and that deep, deep inner knowing that that rumble inside being all on the same tip. That ultimatum that you give your patients reminds me of something Dr. David Hawkins talked about. He was a psychiatrist. I don't know yeah, if you're yeah, familiar. Yeah. He was mm-hmm. a psychiatrist for 50 years, had a huge practice in, in New York and, and then became a spiritual teacher. But he told the story often about in his clinical practice, if somebody came in with, I think it was depression, like with chronic depression, that he would give them the ultimatum that they had to go get a dog a pet dog wow. and he wouldn't treat them until they got the dog wow. for two reasons. One being that dogs carry an en- energy field of oh, unconditional dish. love. They calibrate yeah. quite highly, Absolutely. you know, consciousness wise. <laughs> yeah. And the other was that in many, if not all cases, depression is sort of a focused self-centeredness and mm-hmm. selfishness where yeah. one is so self-absorbed that, oh, I'm the worst person ever, whatever. And that having to care for a dog would often be their medicine, yes. would bring them out of that because then they had to think about and participate with something other than themselves relationally. And I thought that was so cool. So eventually I wasn't depressed. I was feeling fine, but I got a dog in part because of the way he would describe that. I was like, huh, if my life could be even more rich and full and have even 1% more of the energy field of love present, why would I be worried about picking up poop or having to find a sitter or whatever inconveniences I had sort of projected onto this idea of having a pet. And now this freaking dog, I mean, I would say we we're more like on the codependent side of things, you know, like (laughs) I'm like, I got to be with the dog all the time, you know, maybe a little slight pathology there. Cause like, I'm really obsessed with this dog, but like, I can't imagine how I lived my life for all those years without a dog up until I was, I don't know. 45, 46 or something. Absolutely. It was my first one. I'm like, oh my God, why didn't someone tell me that when I was 22 or whatever, you know? I I wasn't ready. I mean, I adopted Mushu, my cat, two years ago, two years ago. And that was a deep dive because cats are very different as you know. And there was a deep dive introduction into another kind of love that I hadn't experienced because he will not be controlled. I mean, the cats are notoriously 
fiercely independent, right? And <laughs> I mean, he like hid under the bed for two months and this yeah. poor dad has a lot of trauma in his history. And, and I couldn't feel love from him. Like I couldn't feel like he loved me and I was obsessed. I'm still obsessed with him. Totally obsessed. Like caring for him. My whole life was like collapsed into this dynamic and I didn't feel like he loved me. Like he wasn't showing me that he loved me. And it was like an exercise in, in this sort of leap of faith into connection that isn't apparent in the ways that I am used to witnessing it, you know, even as yeah. a mother, for whatever yeah. reason, I guess it's, I've still been exercising some forms of control-based love, you know, where my kids, I don't have to say it maybe, I don't know, but they do what I want them to do. My kids are so chill and amazing. And I just have not experienced that, like, you know, whatever I, I experience with Mushu where he does what the hell he wants to do. And it's often not what I want him to do. And I am still here loving him anyway, <laughs> you know, like even though he doesn't show me love in the ways I want him to. And that's so, so funny. Wild. It's so funny to bring that up because Allison brought a cat into the relationship, Jelly, and he's older too. He's like 15. So he's absolutely not going to do anything you want him to do. Yeah. I mean, he doesn't wreck anything. He's not like, he doesn't act out per se. But I still not compliant. <laughs> yeah, I still fool myself and I'll grab him like, I feel like I want the cat to sit on the bed and be cuddly right now. Like never one time have I put him anywhere and he's been like, Yeah, I like this. If I put him anywhere, even on his cat to scratch thing or you know, where I he think goes. where he likes to hang out a lot, which is unfortunately by the Wi Fi router, strangely enough. Anywhere I put him, he just immediately he doesn't exactly. just move, he runs yes. from that spot. And I'm like I'm like, oh, this is so interesting because Cookie on, by contrast, I mean, you can just, anytime you want, flip her upside down, rub her belly. She just turns to jello. Like all she wants to do is just cuddle and be obviously near me or, and now Allison even almost to the same degree. But yeah, the cat is a really interesting relationship to see. And also to see like those impulses. I mean, they're not that relevant, but I do want to control my experience yeah. with the cat, right? Yeah. I want the cat to do this right now yeah. because it makes me feel good. And he's like, nope, doesn't feel good to me. Bye. Yeah, which absolutely. Is, which is a great lesson for how I interact with other people. Because out of my own fears at times, I do have the tendency to want to control, especially uh, as it pertains to other people's health and behavior. Because yeah. like I have a selfish fear of something happening to them yeah. or them getting sick or harming themselves. It's like, yeah, I care about them. But if I look a little deeper... It's out of my own, like, I don't want to ever face pain if they're in pain. Because otherwise, if it didn't pain me for someone I love to be in pain, I wouldn't care what they do. And I would never try to control of them. Course. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, it, and it's, it's also, I think, the the rescuer dynamic. I'm sure most most people know about the Cartman the victim it. triangle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I never made that correlation, but that that is it's what uh, it, that's yeah. true. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, that's the, the sneakiest form of victim consciousness and control-based attachment is the rescuer dynamic i i feel is the rescuer dynamic because you know that's where and it's also so, socially engineered you know our our compassion our coerced compassion and virtue signaling and this idea of appearing to be a good caring individual you know offering yourself for the betterment of others you know oh, like I think by now most of us know that minerals are important, but it's really tough to know which minerals to take without knowing what you need. And mineral imbalance is a huge issue, so guesswork is pretty sketchy. Wouldn't it be great to know not only what minerals you need and which mineral levels are too high? Well, I recently found a very cool way to accurately test all of that and take the guesswork and wasted supplement spending out of the equation. I'm talking about upgraded formulas, upgraded hair test, and consultation. It's really fast and easy to do. You just cut a couple small hair samples, mail it in, and then book your consultation, during which one of their expert staff explains your mineral levels and even your heavy metal toxicity. We just sent in my wife Allison's test and got some good and not so good news. She was luckily very low in lead and mercury, which is awesome, but we also found high aluminum, which is less than ideal. Luckily, her mineral levels look super solid overall, but her magnesium levels were a bit high and her selenium a bit low. So with that accurate information at hand, we did a heavy metals detox protocol to get that aluminum down and also determined that she does not need to supplement magnesium for the time being, but that it would do her some good to up her selenium intake. And not only does upgraded formulas have you covered on the test and consultation, 
but they also happen to make the best absorbed nano minerals I've ever found. Getting your minerals right can sort out hidden deficiencies that are affecting thyroid, adrenal, and many other systems in your body. So I highly recommend you check out the test and consultation at upgradedformulas.com. Now you can also save 15% off your first purchase by using the code Luke at checkout. That link again is upgradedformulas.com. That was one thing I wanted to get in. As, yeah. a, as I predicted, I haven't you looked at my main like- now because I... <laughs> And I knew that would happen, but there were things I wanted to to discuss. And that's one of them. I do yeah. want, I do want to get into that. But before I forget, I want to congratulate you on making it onto the disinformation dozen oh, list. I'm I'm just so proud of you. And I'm going to admit here on on this recording, I felt a little envious when all of you were included in <laughs> that. Such an and arbitrary I, no, I know, I'm, I'm joking, <laughs> but I was like. God, am I not doing something right? No. I should be on there, you know. Not that I really don't want to be. I have enough. Stuff. I have enough problems. But what what's that been like in your your journey? You know, for those that for those that don't know your story, you can go back and listen to the other episodes. I think it was number ninety one and two thirty. If I'm not mistaken, we'll put them in the show notes. But there, we I think especially in the first one, we talked about your journey of being you know a straight laced, accredited psychiatrist totally indoctrinated into the system found flaws in that and eventually ejected yourself out of that and became kelly uh brogan the rogue but what has it been like seeing yourself and you don't seem terribly bothered by it which Mm -hmm. is amazing when did the censorship start to appear Mm -hmm. and when did you start to be you know vilified on such a grand scale a and b how have you been able to love yourself through that and mm. reconcile that and and just stay grounded mm. without that egoic attachment to disapproval or that egoic fear of disapproval and being ostracized and I mean that's such a deep rooted thing within it's, us. Yeah, you know? it's interesting. Well, I'll answer. Okay, so it was it was June. I remember it must have been three years ago that the Google algorithms changed and I was like wiped completely. I had like first page, which anyone who does, you know, who's done this organically over years of writing, writing, writing and SEO and all that stuff, you know, it's, I I had first page results for a a number of things, including weird searches, like gut brain searches and like psychoneuroimmunology and whatever. And I was just wiped. And so now anything that is relevant of the hundreds of essays that I've written cannot be found unless you put kellybroganmd.com in the search, which of course nobody's putting when they're searching right. a new concept. Well, you know, it's funny you mentioned that because when I was getting ready to prep for the interview, I just searched Kelly Brogan and I was like, where's her main website? Yeah. It was like, it was Even on the first that, page, so but it was on the way, on the, on the, all the way down. I'm like, anyone else that has a public persona or, you know, that's been around as long as you have and that, or as popular, like the first thing is going to be your website. Yeah. And it's, it's more problematic if you're, you know, if you're like, what are the dangers of antidepressants during pregnancy or whatever? And you type in antidepressants, first of all, it auto completes in a biased manner. Right. And, and, and then you can't find information that is available. And I, you know, I explained at the time to my daughter, I was like, it's kind of like if you go to the library and you don't know that the librarian has populated the entire library with her favorite books only, right? And, <laughs> right. and you're going to go to that library thinking you're at a public library, but it's like literally her personal collection and you might not go to the library if you knew that. So, you know, when that happened, that was a bummer. And it was the beginning of my awareness and recognition that it's game on, you know, like, and I am playing in their sandbox. Like, the interwebs are theirs, right? <laughs> and I, I can either throw sand around in their sandbox or I can start to energetically, psychologically, professionally, and otherwise personally, like get out, right? Like start to get with this idea of the choices that I do have and starting to envision, you know, so what if I, what if my whole site was eliminated? You know, what, what then? And that what if game is a good one, I think, to play, to explore like all of the hidden boogeymen in our fear closet, right? So what if I couldn't play, you know, digital games anymore? Like, what would I do with my life, you know? And I think about that often. Yeah, it's it's just Especially a now, experiment. Now they're going after Joe Rogan, you know, the godhead of all things podcasting. And I'm like, 
Hmm. When they first, you know, the first thing that I noticed that kind of sounded the alarms was when um, in perfect unison and concert, they deplatform Alex Jones. Mm -hmm. Whether you like Alex Jones or not, whatever. Like, <laughs> unfortunately for some that hate him, he's been right about a lot of stuff mm -hmm. over the years in his own unique way. But when it was so carefully orchestrated and he was just nuked from everything within 48 hours or something, I was like, oh shit, here we go. That's the domino, right? Because you can get someone like that who's so controversial that generally people, unless they're ardent conspiracy theorists, aren't going to put up a fuss or really notice, you know? Most people are going to be like, yeah, Columbine, fuck him or whatever, you know? Which all of that was fake news, by the way, too, if you research it. But when that happened, I started to sweat a little bit, you know? Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, okay. How long before it gets, you know, out of the fringe and comes into the mainstream? And now you see with Joe Rogan, I don't know if you saw this big debacle with Neil Young, which was funny because this morning I saw it was exposed. The entity that bought 50% of Neil Young's catalog for, I think, $150 million recently has very intimate ties with Pfizer. <laughs> and, there, and, you know, anyway, who knows? But to the point of like feeling that or exploring that thought, what am I going to do if when I saw the Joe Rogan thing, I was like, okay, I got to start thinking about that a little bit more. Like, what would I do? Like, it's a good experiment. Would I do yeah. private coaching, you know, like in here in Austin or what? Like, how could I share? Maybe become a salsa dancer. <laughs> yeah. How could I share my gifts? And, you know, if it was, if my presence was shrunk by the powers that be, what, how would I reach people? What would I do? It's and what comes out of that inquiry is, I think, you know, an awareness of whether or not uh, maybe an awareness of the depth of commitment to this being a benevolent universe, right? So if you believe that this is fundamentally a benevolent universe, then it's all going to be exactly what you need. The support you require for your next iteration will show up and there aren't victims who get punished, right? And it can smoke that out if we have anxiety, fear, and stress around these what ifs, right? So if you do, then it's an invitation to make contact with like, I'm on a carpet ride, like I'm on a magic carpet ride and I'm only going to experience that which I actually want to experience. That's right. my worldview, not even need to, but I actually want to. And so there's there were dimensions of me that wanted to experience. I could actually make very easy contact with the parts of me that enjoy being you know, seen as like a rebel renegade, like badass, you know, like how that, that was enculturated in my childhood to be like a legitimizing vibration, you know, like kind of like having a big mouth, Italian, Irish, like that was like the, the way you survived in my family. It was like to be right, rhetorically right, like to mm -hmm. win the argument. And it started to evolve. I mean, in 2016, I had like aerial shots of my house with death threats because of a home birth article that I wrote or at least it was triggered by that from <laughs> Jezebel and these other like pharma funded feminist outlets. And I was called an <laughs> ableist and like all this crazy shit. And Wait, I got to, I have to interject there. So there was some perspective of feminism that had a problem with you promoting home birth. And like I can't think of anything more feminine, female empowering. Oh yeah. No, no, that's not the unilateral <laughs> perspective at all. But it was also my perspective that women might want to reconsider taking psychotropic meds and might want to reconsider taking uh, birth control. And so this, this campaign around calling me an ableist was born. And I never heard that word, but actually... Nor have I. Yeah. So it has almost like eugenics derogatory implications. But at its core, my sense is that it means that I believe that anyone can do what I think I can do. So I'm an ableist. Right. Anyone is able. And I was like, you know what? That's true. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. And I have found in Guilty this, as charged. Right. In this benevolent universe that I choose to live in, that actually all of the criticism that I've been levied has at least a grain, if not like a huge boulder, of truth in it. No one has ever lied. They could make up all sorts of shit. Nobody has ever lied. I mean, I've been called an AIDS denialist. I've been you know, called out for how much I charge in private practice, you know, true. It's all true, right? Like I, 
I, you may not like it. You may take issue with it. You may judge my character. Then that the character assassination, of course, is the, is the weapon of, of the scientism war. But it's, it's not like, you know, slander and libel in even the sense that it could be. So yeah, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah, like in the realm of politics, there's a lot of slander and libel. There's a lot of slinging of untruths to demonize and yeah, the other I ex- the Maybe opposition. Maybe I don't know about it, but I have an experience. That's that's it. very interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. I think I noticed kind of a a bit of a split when this con convid thing rolled out, and I was pretty outspoken about my opposition to it, or at least questioning it from the beginning. And then when the um, George Floyd thing happened, there was another little bubble of that because I wasn't telling the line and I wasn't doing what people told me that I should be doing. I was responding to it according to my heart and intuition and how I felt. But what's been interesting is that, and I don't know, I just know a way to quantify like how many people I lost that were into my work or what I'm doing here. But there was a bit of pushback and some criticism around my perspectives on these things. And it was a little unnerving, not much, because I just believe in my heart that I'm doing what I believe to be true and um, being in integrity. I know when I'm out of integrity, it feels like shit. And that didn't feel that way. It felt like, no, go harder. (laughs) You know, that's the message I got. But, you know, when people are like, you suck, we hate you, you're whatever, it's not that comfortable. Even if you know it's not true, it causes you maybe to question yourself. But the interesting result of that was, and continues to be, that the people that have sort of stuck with me, that listen to my podcast that are now on the, the really daring ones are on my telegram channel <laughs> lukestory.com slash telegram <laughs> enter at your own risk it's very fear porn it's the alarm that i'm sounding that i can't sound anywhere else <laughs> but people actually were more how do i say it like the people that were into the stuff i'm doing became even more loyal yeah. and even more empowered and even more supportive because they were witnessing the fact that i was willing to take some arrows and speak my truth so it's like and Almost. then the arrows wane, like because the yeah. coherence of your field is right. organized. But it's kind of like a pruning of the people that yeah. I probably couldn't reach anyway. They're not my people. They're going to watch CNN or wherever they get their information, and good for them. You know, I'm not trying to like convert people. I'm just speaking what I believe to be true at any given moment, and hopefully admitting, you know, when I find out something wasn't true. Oh shit, I made a mistake about that. Yeah. I'll do my best to correct it, but weathering the storm of like disapproval is so worth it with when on the other side of that like you have your tribe and you get each other and there's that system of support and camaraderie and the you know the strength in numbers Mm -hmm. right it's like no we're not alone i'm not alone the world is a benevolent place and there are tons of other people that see it that way and we're just going to live our lives as if all of this is serving a purpose that we don't quite yet understand and we're just going to keep doing the right thing to the best of our understanding yeah. So it's, I don't know, the deplatforming and censorship and all of that kind of stuff has a very positive impact in terms of concretizing you and your clan. Yeah. Well, that's what I was joking about is that, you know, at a time where I've been deplatformed off of Facebook and the Google algorithm and, you know, of course, other forms of shadow banning and and follower pruning <laughs> that happens on Instagram. It's like every week there's like 8,000 more just dropping off, whatever. And I've been at the same number of followers for two years. Me too. Yeah, yeah me too. <laughs> whatever. So, I, mean, I still like to post my dance videos there. That it, this disinformation doesn't thing. I mean, for me, it was like there's there have been some folks who've been very interested in criticizing my works, some young, younger men. And it's always had the feeling of like little boys, like pulling my braids on the Are playground. you talking about like these beta male conspirituality guys? Oh my God. Uh, Insufferable. Yeah, it's sad. I feel like they it's, masturbate to me regularly and it's, that's sweet, but it's not, <laughs> it's not where I'm going to, I don't care. It does I not, know. it's funny and sweet. And, but there seemed to be some connection because I, you know, I, I wouldn't otherwise necessarily put myself in the 12 people who are putting out, I don't even put out vaccine related information. I mean, I have, I have tons of it on my site, but it's not been my focus because I don't know that we make decisions about vaccines based on science any longer. I I think that we're in a moment of deep trauma-based mind control. And if you are making decisions for or against vaccines and you're doing so with great passion from either side of the aisle, you're doing so from your 
trauma. That's my belief. And so what I'm going to, I'm going to show you my published paper on the psychobiology of vaccine adverse effects. Like you don't, you can't engage through your executive mind when you're in your limbic, you know? And so I've been very chiefly interested in smoking out the aspects of parentification of these authorities through vilification or compliance, right? It's the same energy. And then what it could look like to relate to what's happening through that, you know, the the mixed psychology, the good, bad object coexisting, as we were talking about earlier, of of the sovereign adult. Like, what does that look like? And so that's what I've been talking about for many, many months. So how did I end up on that list other than, you know, whatever, these, these wankers? Um, I find that the... The categories of the woke cancelers, right? You have the establishment, right? So there's people in media, there's people in the pharmaceutical industry that are aware of a Kelly Brogan and they're like, ah, we got to talk to big tech. We got to get her off Mm -hmm. Facebook, right? There's that kind of the powers that be in their concerted efforts to keep counter narrative um, silent. What's interesting to me, like just socially, is people like those guys who, uh, maybe they are incentivized. Who knows? I got in the beginning of this thing, I forgot about this for a while, but I got an email asking me um, to promote the vaccine and that I would get paid for it. Wow. Yeah. And I'm like, I mean, I'm like ready. I'm at the keyboard, just like, oh, you motherfuckers. You know what I mean? And I think, I think it was Allison at the time was like, dude, don't engage no, like don't that. Engage. You know, I was tempted. Like, what's that going to do if I send them some seething email anyway? So maybe there are some people that have podcasts, social media accounts that have been co-opted and even are funded. I'm sure that exists. But with the, with those guys in, in question in their mom's basement, it appears on their videos. <laughs> like <laughs> uh, funny, funny stuff. Like, what is it psychologically? There's some crazy, uh, like pro- like major projection. You know, it's like super shadow projecting. It's a bad mommy. It's it's like this stunning lack of self-awareness that someone who is literally trying to make a career out of being an online troll, like if you talk about like one of the lowest levels of human consciousness, Bottom feeder. Yeah. yeah, it's like <laughs> an online troll is something that is, that's disparaging if you would call someone that like, oh, he's an online troll. It's like not cool or something that one would aspire to. And there are these people that are literally like trying to make a brand out of being online trolls with the purpose, I assume, to protect other people from people like you and I. I, It's the rescuer. It's the same thing. But like, what's going on there that you could be so blind to your own unhealed trauma and shadow that you literally spend like your time and energy obsessing on your videos and commenting on them? They did one on me the other day. And frankly, I was flattered. I was like, <laughs> finally, you guys found me. I've been doing this shit for seven years. Like I, I even posted, I was like, please do a podcast about me. I, l- I actually listen to that podcast sometimes so with like a morbid curiosity, just as a psychological, I don't know, almost a study. Like, what is this thing? It's so interesting to me. And I, you know, I don't think they're going to do it because I'm not famous enough or something, but I'm just looking at, and they're not the only ones that other people like that, but like, how much pain does a person have to be in interpersonally inside themselves to motivate them to literally spend hours and hours a day to try and tear someone else down? I mean, when you could take that energy and actually build something. Of course. Yourself. You don't know that you have that creative power until you know you do. And so you, you opt for the surrogate hit of, blame and judgment and finger pointing. It's not different than what I used to do and what many activists still do when we obsess about the government and the FDA and the AMA and the Fauci's and the Gates and all of their every moves. I mean, it's still the same vibration of I don't like what you're doing. You should change. Oh, this that's is funny. bad. That's funny. So I'm like confused as to what motivates these people. And I'm like, I do that too. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Sorry to point that out. <laughs> that's great. No, that's great. Cause I do, you know, it's, it's, get, it's, it's falling for duality. You know what I mean? Is what it is. That's when I see myself getting pulled into that where I'm like, Oh, someone has to stop this Bill Gates or this Fauci. Like, not that I'm trying to stop them, but I, I might illuminate some things about them that could 
cause people to question their yeah and you you do you, know, you you speak your truth but the moment that you need someone to change or something to change in order for you to feel empowered and okay you're in victim consciousness and to my mind that is I mean, I've said this a million times, like it's the only human pathology. It is what causes injury and harm. And if you want to use the word evil, which I certainly don't use lightly, I believe that it emerges from the field of victim consciousness and nothing else. So, I mean. So what, how does the perpetrator's behavior and actions, how are they, how, how is that motivated by victim consciousness, like victim consciousness that's unhealed within themselves or just that dynamic that in that duality, there has to be a perpetrator and a victim and the perpetrators are just playing that role because there's so many willing victims. Right. Well, the perpetrator feels victimized themselves or they wouldn't be feeling entitled to aggressive recourse. Uh, Right. So in the, so it's called the Cartman triangle, the drama triangle, victim triangle, and there's three you know, angles, there's, there's the victim, right? So when you're in this poor me, no fair, I can't believe this is happening again, that like, this is horrible. My life sucks. Like moment you're the victim. <laughs> right. And that's to we, me is when I text someone F M L one hundred percent. that is the banner. And I catch myself. Over. I'm like, don't, don't put that in writing. You know, I'm like, I can't, I'm just feeling that I have to express that right now. Fuck my life. It's just yes, so frustrating. Exactly. That is, that is the banner of, of, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, God for, moment. you know, discounting the gift of my life. But don't yeah. apologize because it is, well, I mean, I can explain where I think it comes from, but it's not just my idea. Like this is, this is the perpetuation of child psychology into adulthood. And it's not wrong. It's not bad. It's a natural consequence of not being initiated into adulthood. You know, that we we carry all of this fear-based experience of power being outside of us into our adulthood. And that's an illusion that we resolve as we adult, right? As we mature. So yeah, so there's there's the victim. And often we enter, many people enter that through none other than the medical model, right? When you get a diagnosis and you experience this, oh my God, this is so scary. This is so unfair. I can't believe this is happening. Why is this happening to me? Like the cancer diagnosis or whatever. And you triangulate, right? So you triangulate with a rescuer who is themselves in victim consciousness because they believe that They only have worth, power, legitimacy. They're otherwise victimized by the circumstances of life that say you are unlovable and unworthy. They only have that when they are helping, saving, or otherwise controlling someone else's experience, right? Uh, And they are reifying that person's victimization because they're implying that they can't otherwise help themselves. So the psychology of you're a victim. And secretly, I'm a victim. I just don't want to show that or talk about that is very alive in that connection. And usually the rescuer in this case is the doctor, right? It's the medical system. But this can be outside of obviously the medical framework. I mean, if if my girlfriend can't pay her rent and I say, and I just, you know, wire her three grand, I am the rescuer in that dynamic who is imagining that she can't figure out the meaning of why her life has reached this financial screeching halt and she can't divine her way out of it. She doesn't have what it takes. So I'm reifying her victimhood, enabling it, supporting it, structuring it. And then I'm also engaging this inner belief that I am unable to experience love, connection, approval, or my own personal power unless I am managing another's experience and giving something that I may not actually want to give otherwise, right? So I'm showing up to that dynamic as a good person who does for others. And I'm not doing that because I am a good person who does for others. I don't believe in that. I don't believe in altruism. I'm doing that because it's the only way I know to meet my needs. I cannot meet them directly. I cannot say, I really want your approval. And can you give that to me, right? I say, I will earn your approval by paying your rent. Right. And then and I, even maybe ingratiate you into an unacknowledged contract. Yes. Right. 
And that's why consent is so important, right? If Mm -hmm. I say to her, how do you feel if I pay your rent? And she said, wow, that would be amazing. And I'll pay you back in three months. That's a completely different consented, aware engagement. And you can still smoke out the rescuer because if you would feel resentment, if somebody didn't express or experience gratitude, then don't do it. <laughs> totally. Then don't do it. Totally. Because you're doing that's, it. That's great. Manipulatively. That's great. Yeah. And that's actually how I ended up coming up with my fees in private practice, which in Manhattan is very normative. But nonetheless, I charged what I would charge if somebody hated me for what I did for them because I worked my ass off, you know, in that practice. And my, you know, it was, oh my gosh, a huge energy commitment. And I needed to get to a place where it was neutralized energetically. And if I was not appreciated, you know, for what I offered, then I would be okay with that. And because money is energy, it kind of worked out and ended up helping me to see where I would otherwise have been investing and giving and, you know, answering that phone call or staying on or staying in a session 10 minutes over or whatever, doing things, little micro abandonments that could only be balanced out through appreciation, gratitude, and an experience of, of a kind of love that I didn't know how to ask for directly, of course. And you could argue it's not even appropriate in the professional setting, but I think these are operative in every dynamic. When you say you don't believe in altruism, is that based on the idea that when we participate in something altruistic, there's an inherent feedback of benefit Mm -hmm. to ourselves? That's the only reason we do anything. So like I give someone an exorbitant tip And I think, oh man, poor kid, he's been working his ass off. It's it's a pandemic, et cetera. I'm going to give him 50 bucks when I only need to give him 20 or whatever, right? Right. So that would be an act of altruism. But Mm -hmm. really, I guess you could say I'm doing that because it makes me feel good. What if he's offended by that, actually? And he feels belittled and degraded by your tip. Do you still feel good about doing it? Right. Because there's a presupposition that he's a victim of his exactly. job, right? And exactly. I'm, I'm now white male savior or whatever, you know, right. I just have to throw the white male thing in there because it's so <laughs> popular, so popular these days, <laughs> but right? Like, right. So if you were doing it for him, then it wouldn't matter how you experience his reaction. It's not relevant variable, yeah. but you're not doing it for him. In my opinion, you're doing it for you and not because you're like a selfish, shitty evil person because we are wired with needs and we will meet those needs without exception. That's all we're doing every day, you know, and this is like spirituality. Like why do people go into spirituality? You know, why are they attracted to the practices and the approaches and the technologies of, of so-called spirituality? Because they want to feel better, right? Like that is why anybody does anything. Right. Not because they're a fundamentally good person who's here to share their overflowing <clears throat> cup of Shakti with the world. I mean, it's like... <laughs> I know very few people, very few, if any, that are seriously, I mean, seriously surrendered into spiritual growth. You know, we're like, that's the only path that haven't arrived there without the motivation of abject suffering. Yeah. I meet them every once in a while because I interview so many incredible people, many of whom are spiritually oriented. Say every once in a while, someone's like, I've just always been this way. When I was a kid, I was just interested in this stuff and my parents were really healthy and everything was chill and I just like it. And I'm like, what? (laughs) Freak of nature, you know? (laughs) Totally. Almost everyone had trauma, addiction, failure at something, right? And they're like, okay, nothing here in the earth realm is providing the answers that I need. So I'm going to go into the metaphysical realm and see if I can find it. It's all pain mitigation strategies. And that's why, like personally, when it comes to like substances or behaviors, even cutting or whatever, I, I don't identify the behavior or the substance, obviously, as the, as the, the problem. It's a pain mitigation strategy. Sometimes being a patient is a pain mitigation strategy. I mean, I worked with many women who would get to the end of our work together and my intention for my patients was always for them to never be a patient again, literally ever again under any circumstances. So you're pharma free for life, you know, and that's not just your psychotropics and you don't have a need for that dyadic 
experience of the doctor patient relationship. You really don't. And they would get to that threshold of like flight into the wild unknown of doctor free living and want to crawl back into the nest, right? Because there's so many things that we get out of our pain mitigation strategies that are not conscious, obviously, and they're not, we're not aware of them, but they're working. They're working until they don't work. That's why you do what you want to do. I'm a big believer in doing exactly what you want to do until, you know, you want to do something different. And that's how you end up actually restoring the connection to your own inner drive, your own inner desire and your sense of um, alignment. Because as, as kids, what we want to do, we're fundamentally conditioned to believe is wrong. And that is on a behavioral level, like we want to go outside or we don't want to eat our dinner or whatever. And, and don't do that and do that. And, but then also an emotional level, what are we told when we cry? Stop crying and calm down or go to your room until you know how to talk to me or whatever. It's just this divorce, this like, like fracturing between our, our sense of, of connection to movement in the world and an awareness that we can't trust ourselves to know what's best for us to do. And when you say that you've never disciplined your kids, and I'm not, I'm not yet a parent. I'm working on it. Just the, the hope you're enjoying the working. The on prospect, it, right? yeah, I'm, yeah, it's it's not bad. <laughs> the prospect of being a parent has always been terrifying to me because there's so many unknowns and there were so many things that I just didn't learn experientially as I was parented, right? But I can't imagine a kid, you know, acting up just without a lack of a better term, you know, jumping on the couch. They're about to spill something. They're being loud in a place where it's not appropriate. Like, what do you do if you're not? if there is no disciplinary action or repercussions for their behavior, if their behavior is out of line, like what does one do? What do you do? I find that fascinating. It's, I think there's a meta orientation that delivers a very different experience, right? Like if I am, because I started in my sort of like fuck the man <laughs> path before I had my first daughter, I already was interested in doing everything differently. Right. So my kids have never had pharmaceuticals and had natural births and whatever. And I was interested in um, parenting paradigms, mindful parenting, these kinds of things that were a, a fundamental divergence from obviously the ways in which we were parented, which are punishment and reward based. There's an amazing book called Unconditional Parenting by this guy, Alfie Cohn, and he talks about. Ooh, noted. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's very excellent to disabuse us of the impact and enculturation that comes not only from punishment. I mean, that's kind of obvious, right? But even from sort of like, I don't know, it's like a pursed lip kind of like restrained disciplinary approach, like timeouts, for example. So we're not hitting and screaming, but there's still this kind of like control-based interaction with your child's behavior. But then also praise, right? So if if I praise little Sally for giving a blueberry to Billy. And I said, that's so nice that you shared that blueberry with Billy. Now she has an externalized reward system for sharing. And the reason that she's going to share a blueberry in the future is because she gets approval from her mama and not because it feels good to share. And that's why she did it in the first place. It feels fundamentally good to connect to another child in that way. It's like the precursor to, to, uh, Virtue signaling, virtue signaling. <laughs> right, right? No, yeah. what you're laughing is 100% yeah. true. Yeah. That's where that comes from. Wow. It's where it comes from. It's the parentification of the watching eye of the government or, you know, whatever that ultimately is mommy. I call it mommy medicine and daddy yeah. government that we are longing for this approval to be seen as, as good. And there are like infinite assumptions, you know, like it, why grandma should you know, why, wear a mask for grandma or whatever, get your vaccine for grandma or whatever. As an example or emblem of the virtue signaling concept, you should be doing this. Sacrifice yourself for the greater good or for the vulnerable, the immunocompromised. And there's so many assumptions in there, right? Like that it's, that I'm a good person if I do a good thing for someone else, even if it's a bad thing for me, that's an assumption, right? That I you know, that doing that, like one, one wrong and a right make a right. Right. And so who is right is more important. Who is more vulnerable? 
Well, the assumption is that for whatever reason, I might not want to wear a mask, whether it's, you know, that I was gang raped as a, as a child and, and partially suffocated and putting anything over my face brings me back to that moment. Or it's simply that I don't like to do anything uncomfortable when I don't want to do it, <laughs> like whatever it, in the range of things, or maybe I have some respiratory, you know, compromise that makes it difficult for me to breathe through one or whatever. It doesn't matter that that could be evaluated against someone else's fear and put like triaged and put into some metric, right? So we all pray at the altar of safety and avoidance of death through the lens of germ theory. <laughs> but there's so many assumptions in that simple suggestion that you should wear a mask for grandma that that have not been consented to or clarified or, you know, even exposed to the light of day. I mean, implied in that is that we both believe that germs cause illness. You know, Im- implied in that is that masks are effective. Implied in that, you know, are are many assumptions about my fears being less important than hers. And so the the roots of virtue signaling absolutely originate in conditioned childhood experiences of good and bad behavior. But I think for me, the big reveal was like, oh, wow, it's not just punishment, it's praise. And so I dedicated myself early on to visiting because this is my major wound is that like my, not just me, obviously, but like my feelings don't matter and I can't be trusted for what I think, right? And so when I have a feeling and I'm in a relationship where someone's feeling about my feeling takes the mic, I'm back in the wound space of my childhood, right? So how do I resolve that? Well, I resolve that by when my child has a feeling, I contain my own experience. I become the vessel, the masculine vessel for my own inner feminine. And I cross the bridge and I visit with her experience first. And it's not about my experience of her experience. I am the adult, right? I didn't get that as a child. And I don't know that most of us did. And my nervous system is healed enough. My awareness is online enough. And my spiritual dedication to ending this cycle is fortified sufficiently where that is my number one priority. Right. So like I had an experience just the other day because I've been doing a lot of yet again, more inner child work, never ending. And I've become really interested in in like two questions. Right. So like what is the primary disappointment that I experienced as my, you know, father's daughter and mother's daughter? So you do this with both parents. If you're having relationship issues, you focus typically on like, you know, the opposite gender if you're heterosexual, but you do it with both. So what is the primary disappointment? pain, trauma, challenge, right? Like what's what's the number one thing you didn't get? And then what was the desire underneath that, right? So what is the, the number one thing you want still to this day to experience? And I asked, so I sat my kids down and I asked them that. I said, you know, like wh- what, you know, what is, what is the thing? Like I did super wrong in your childhood. And my kids are almost 13 and 10. And then I said, you know, what is it that you want that I'm not giving you? And they were super like, oh, I don't know. Do I have to tell you or whatever? Can I write you a, a letter or whatever? Yeah, yeah. And I was like, I want to know. I want to know now. I want to know yesterday so that I can work to give this to you. And I said, I don't know that I can because I can only love you as much as I love myself, you know? So I don't know that I can. And, you know, I'll tell you that the feedback that I got from one of my daughters was devastating. Like truly, and not because it was anything like I didn't really know or whatever, but it gave me the feeling like I'm failing at being a mother and I'm failing at giving her an experience that's fundamentally different from mine emotionally that I had as a child. And, and that's apparently what I think I came here for was to like end these cycles in my family and to finally learn how to love and to finally experience love and offer my children an experience of love in this lifetime. And, and I, you know, it was like super basic feedback about like, you know, kind of the subtle ways in which I make it not okay to have a different opinion, you know, for example, or whatever, which I already know that's operative. It's like, I don't need to yell or punish or spank or whatever for my, the, the subtle experience of my energetic reign, you know, mm-hmm. to be very constraining for my children. And that was my moment where I was like, Kelly, this is it. Like, this is 
this is your moment in your lifetime, maybe like literally the most important opportunity you've created for yourself for you to put your defensive shit aside. Nobody cares right now about your story, about all these things you did, because that's always how the victim shows up. It's like, after all I've done, how dare you, right? Like all of the work I have done to wake the hell up, all of the things that I've done to show up for my kids differently, psychologically, physically, you know, medically, like spiritually, I feel like, like you, like I've been like, it's like a full-time job, you know, just trying to develop my consciousness and awareness and to heal and integrate and, and to not feel appreciated for that, you know, which I, of course I am. My kids show me appreciation all the time. So it's not rational, right? It's excludes the awareness of the appreciation. And it's a focus on, you know, this, this criticism or perceived indictment. And how can I put all of that aside and literally cross the bridge to be with her experience of me. And that's it. So if she thinks I'm selfish and this and that or whatever, the horrible, not that she said this, but like, let's say, like, let's say your kid says, I hate you. You're the worst dad ever, right? He's like five. Can you go over and be like, wow, you must be super upset, you know, to say that to me? Like, what's going on? The point being, like, can you just be with his experience or her experience emotionally and show up to validate that and give a shit about what they're experiencing more than you give a shit about what you're experiencing internally? Not because what you're experiencing doesn't matter, but because you know how to hold yourself. You don't need your child to hold you. You don't need your child to be um, the stabilizing force for your internal emotional world. And and if you <laughs> and if you make them that stabilizing force, you are fucking that kid You're up. You're perpetuating the same <laughs> shit we're all healing from. Yeah, it's the narcissistic yeah. extension, right? Where yeah. your child, whether it's because they need to get A's. I mean, I'm running a super weird experiment with my kids because, you know, I like 4.0 went to MIT and Ivy League med school and all this stuff. And that was you know, I'm second generation Italian and anyone who has immigrant parents knows that you kind of need to validate and prove like that it was worth it for them to leave their motherland or whatever. And a lot of times it's channeled through achievement and a focus on performance and whatever else. And, and I got really into the unschooling movement and took my kids out of school and I don't want them to go to school. You know, I don't believe in that model any longer. And Good for you. Your kids are stoked. <laughs> that's what you would think. But there's a plot twist, okay. which is that after. I mean, in the long term, not that they enjoy that process, but just mm-hmm. looking back on how damaging school was for me, I'm like, oh, God. it's an indoctrination camp, obviously. And part of the unschooling model is that they drive decision making around what they want to do to learn and, and expand. And both of my kids decided that they wanted to go back to school. I was like, what? No, no, you're staying home with me and we're going to do like Tuttle Twins and learn about libertarianism and whatever else. And, and so now they go to school and I'm, I'm blessed to have uh, a local option that is very aligned with my value system. However, you know, I don't check their homework. I don't even know what the hell they're doing. I have nothing to do with it. So it's their gig. And, you know, they're, many who say that by the age of like 12, you, you have the intellectual capacity to participate in pretty much any adult endeavor that you might be interested in. And, you know, my eldest was an example of that. She had a business and, and a job, you know, before she went back to school and it all atrophied on the vine, but whatever. And they are in charge of whether or not their grades matter. I don't literally don't care. It does not matter at all to me. It has no value. So I've like totally exsanguinated that, you know, otherwise very charged field of the transitional object of like grades. I mean, um, it's super interesting. And for them, it's, it like kind of matters, but also not like with huge importance. So when you can allow your kids to internally locate a sense of, of value and worth, then they figure out whether something actually is an accurate reflection of that inner dimension of, of value. And it's only when it's externalized onto authority figures that we learn and practice and become habituated to self-abandonment, which of course then we experience in our primary romantic relationships and 
dynamics and then blame others for, you know, that which we are doing to ourselves. <laughs> ultimately as so it goes and so it goes exactly. i want to ask you thank you for that i took big notes on that in the par- <laughs> i'm very interested in parenting right now you know i'm like i gotta i'm probably gonna do a bunch of shows about it actually i do have a great one coming up uh, i'm gonna record one thing that i am often mystified by is how many spiritual leaders that are well respected and seem to be quite conscious and awake have been duped into going along with this system. You know, you're, I don't know that much about Sadhguru, but as an example of someone There's many examples. Deepak, Most examples. Deepak Chopra, you know, whoever. There's so many people that have kind of towed the line. And I think like, how could you meditate for so many years and not see through this? And then not only those leaders, but some of these very well-respected institutions like Esalon and Omega Institute, I mean... I think, yeah, a friend of, a close friend of mine got invited to do like a workshop at, I think it was Omega yeah. and, you know, right on their website, like you got to have the thing to come in here. And I'm like, what? Like head exploding emoji. I'm like, <laughs> you guys, it's like a lot of the boomers, you know, that were so anti-establishment. I mean, Neil Young, case in point, right. That were so anti-establishment and free thinking and spiritually introspective and brave and courageous and curious that were so easily brainwashed. I don't understand that. Like, how does that, from your perspective, Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not all knowing, but what is going on with that? It's this cultural phenomenon that is just so confusing to me. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it was not confusing because I wrote a a blog years ago called um, Open Letter to the Spiritual Community. And I did so because of how many self-appointed spiritual gurus and teachers were um, endorsing and promoting, even defending antidepressants, right, in my perspective, and other psychotropics. And I felt at that time confused because I said, okay, hold on a minute, right? If, If our emotional experiences and our internal, you know, darkness and our relationship to adversity and challenges is itself the grist for the spiritual mill, then why would we ever avoid, suppress, bypass, or otherwise reject that? Isn't the whole point that the journey is through, not around, right? Beneath or somehow running in the other direction? Isn't isn't the <laughs> nature of the spiritual process and so-called like consciousness elevation to resolve that, that good, bad split? and to come into coherent integrity, the good bad split is the assignment of bad feelings as bad <laughs> and good feelings as good. But I thought, right, the whole goal of spirituality was to understand it's all a part, right? It's all essential. And that also applies to the body, doesn't it, right? Like since when is illness a bad thing? What is a bad thing? Isn't a bad thing just an experience of our container being too small to, to, to hold what it is that we more fully are, right? So it needs to break, right? Isn't that what adversity and challenge is? So I, at that point, resolved the cognitive dissonance through really an understanding of the role of Cartesianism, right? Like the role of the, the casting out of the spirit or the soul from the body, so this duality, right? This this is the meat suit. This is where the sinful, dirty things happen. And out there is God and divinity and transcendence and, you know, true connection and love and light. It's all in the spiritual realms. And how do we access that? We transcend this. And, you know, Steiner and others would talk about that as a fundamentally Luciferian concept, right? To transcend this material realm, uh, to experience God. Versus, you know, myself and others who feel that, and and we were just talking about this earlier, that actually the means of experiencing your divinity is through this body. This body is your spirituality. They are the same. And so when I started to understand, okay, well, there's many, many centuries actually of, well, through one historical lens. Now I don't believe anything I've ever been taught. Everything requires like a caveat of like history and and media making events and even 
people like Alex Jones, like it's just like psyop uh, around every corner. But anyway, this idea of, you know, the body and the spirit as being separate, has, we've been enculturated around that for, I mean, that's the body as machine is the foundation of allopathic medicine, right? So your your experience has no meaning, your symptoms are purposeless nuisance and you know, death is to be avoided at all costs. And that's how we define health. It's the absence of death. It's you're surviving, right? It's not about thriving or vitality or an experience of meaning in your life or your personal narrative evolving and developing. It's not about any of that. That's why nothing really matters, but this material concept of genetic based health and managing it through, you know, um, the gifts of, of, of the pharmaceutical industry. So when you look at the way that the new age, so, you know, that's how I refer to it. The new age has potentially even been engineered, if you want to believe in, in such things as social engineering, how it's been engineered to capture a certain segment of the society and to strategically control concepts like health and healing and mindfulness and meditation and self-work. You can see how this has already happened in other realms like naturopathy and midwifery, where these ancient, if you want to say, practices and, and frameworks have been captured and, and greenwashed and given licensure and all sorts of regulatory entitlements and funding for the low, low price of complying with all of the more overarching belief systems of scientism, right? And, and the most dominant um, belief system of our, of our time is the allegiance to, to science. I mean, look at people like the Dalai Lama has been shilling for vaccines and putting polio vaccines into kids' mouths, and, you know, for, for many, many, many years. I mean, there's, there's been this hierarchy of world religions where, where scientism has always been at the top. And that's by design. And germ theory specifically and its role in allopathic, you know, in the allopathic belief system is, of course, coming into the fore right now. And it is predicated fundamentally on the belief that the invisible badness, so remember that good, bad split, the invisible badness is out there. It's the problem. And if you are to be the good person, remain the good person, which of course we want to, right? Like Sally giving the blueberry to Billy. If you're to remain the good person that you need to be in order to feel safe and like you can secure love because otherwise you might be exposed for being a bad person. You'll never be loved and you'll be rejected and abandoned. Then you're going to do what is required of the good person to stay away from the bad stuff, right? Which is the germs, the illness, you know, death, all the rest of it. And you're going to comply and be obedient. So to me, when the health food stores and the Omega Institutes, and I I can think of like maybe one or two exceptions, the spiritual gurus started to capitulate to the dominant narrative and start shilling for the vaccine and virtue signaling, mask wearing and everything else. To me, that made sense because they probably only ever related to spirituality through this body spirit split where they there wasn't an awareness. I mean that's literally why I wrote on yourself. It's literally for the spiritual community to start to understand how and why the body is a spiritual expression of beingness and you cannot separate the two. You can't have put antidepressants in the body while you're exploring your spiritual dimensions of you know relating to sadness and grief and weaving it into the fabric of your So there's this polarized story. this polarized position where one side on the new age side is kind of having a reductionist approach to spirit is all that matters, right? The whole you are not your body, you are not your mind teaching of meditative practices and then on the other side in the um, allopathic medical system, that's all you are, right? Yes, so both, exactly. So both sides are kind of doing the same thing and discounting. And meanwhile, in the middle, there's this bridge where you are both, you're everything. Right. right? And, and, and Steiner put forth a rubric where that's aramonic and the materialist reductionist is aramonic and, and Lucifer's on the other side and Christ is in the middle. I mean, however you want to conceptualize that these are, these polarities and this triangulation is not new. Mm -hmm. And I think Personally, from my perspective, spiritual bypass 
as it's often referred to, is it's the most dangerous force at play because it's the wolf in sheep's clothing, right? Like if you're somebody who believes that your body is to be managed and genes are the determination of your health experience and that death is a horrible thing to be avoided and, you know, that this is essentially like a machine waiting to break down that you need mechanics to maintain, then it's internally consistent that you would subscribe to everything that's on on offer in the dominant narrative. Go do that if that works for you, right? And if you're like, you know, my body is infinitely wise, like it knows how to heal and I just have to create the conditions for that and I'm going to establish my entire life in coherence with that approach and psychology and spiritual worldview and no thank you on pharmaceuticals, I'm good. And actually no thank you on doctors in general. And if I experience symptoms, I'm going to go in with a curious mind and I'm going to unpack the message from my soul to my mind that my body is delivering me. And I'm going to do that through German New Medicine or through other modalities, you know, that are going to support my allegiance to my own body. I will not betray my body because I am my body right? And we betray our bodies whenever we want our symptoms to go away or be different. We see them as a problem, right? So if you're in that camp, then none of this has any relevance. Like medicine, my kids have never been to an emergency room or a doctor. It has no relevance to our lives. It's literally, I'm not fighting it like, oh, Tylenol is bad. Never, never. It's literally not relevant to our household. Okay. So that's another camp that makes sense that you just don't do this whole thing that's happening, right? You don't put the thing up your nose because you don't need to know about (laughs) a positive or negative test of something that you don't even believe in. Like it's not relevant. But the middle camp that I affectionately refer to as the New Agers, like this camp seems to be borrowing from both polarities, masquerading as more aligned with the health sovereign spiritualists, right? On some level, but then also insisting, you know, that disease is bad, that germs are dangerous and that death is to be avoided. And I think it's because so much of new age spirituality is still founded on this good, bad trauma split, you know, that is acting out through the dimensions of spiritual bypass and avoidance of suffering, avoidance of pain, avoidance of looking at how our unseen motives are actually causing harm. I mean, have you ever seen somebody like screaming, I mean, or her online or whatever, like screaming at somebody about how they should be wearing a mask? Like that's how they're expressing like deep concern for the human experience, health and wellness, and like our, our interconnected fabric of responsibility to one another it looks like that, you know, like, like hostility, that incoherence always reveals itself, right? Whenever our unseen dimensions of selfishness and self-servingness are not made conscious, they become felt by others, right? And that's how we end up being exposed for our motives that we refuse to look at because we can't own our selfishness, our laziness, our inner cheater, our inner manipulator. Like we're all of these things. We are all, all of these things. And when we pretend that we are spiritually superior or ethically or morally in some like high horse, and we know what is best for others, that was a, that was a hard bridge for me to cross because as somebody who's been in the vaccine activism realm for many, many years, especially when it comes to children, like I felt like, no, I, I know what's best for your kid. You know, your kid should not be vaccinated. And when you can get to a place where you actually don't, don't assume that you have any idea what somebody needs to experience, literally no idea. When I see a child in a mask, there's some part of my heart that goes into like spasm to this day, two years later. And there's this other part I can recruit that says, you know what? I have no idea what that child needs, what that child signed up for, you know, what that child's karma you know, entails. And that's not to say that I stop feeling because I do think the dehumanization is a very <laughs> essential part of this agenda rolling out as planned and predicted. However, it is to, to see the separateness and to like offer a reverent gaze, even when I want something to be different. It's like that, that I thou 
experience of separateness that is totally essential before we come into the oneness, right? Because when we come into the oneness of the fabric of the greater good, before we've established ourselves as separate entities, it's a mess. It's like, you know, liver cells being in the eye cell region, you know, like we have to get organized into the mandala or we, we will not function as an effective, you know, sort of vessel. But I, I do think that spiritual bypass and the ways in which we are engaging it in our own lives personally, like the ways that we are flying into transcendent experience or, or identifying as, you know, spiritual, like, oh, everything's this way for a reason, like before we want to actually feel the pain of a given situation, it becomes just an elaborate addiction, you know, an elaborate escape tool. And that's why I think it's like very problematic, but it's also perfect. Like, you know, if you (laughs) take your vaccine to go on Esther Hicks cruise or whatever, you know, and (laughs) you outsource I would literally, I, I heard that that's oh, being required God. and you outsource your agency around your body and your decision making to your spiritual teacher, you may have the opportunity to learn that there are consequences to that, right? Like maybe it's a time where we cannot outsource to any teachers, to any gurus, to any doctors, to any masters, to any authorities any longer in a way that is fundamentally self-violating and self-betraying without there being consequence. And maybe a vaccine is not self-betraying or self-violating to one person. But again, it's that inner rumble. Like, do you have a little sense of like, oh, I wouldn't otherwise do this if she didn't say it was good. And that then you self-betray, you self-abandon in service of securing connection. That's really what it is. It's connection, approval, a sense of safety. And I, I think that 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 those micro self-abandonments or macro self-abandonments have bigger and bigger consequences now, you know. In, in the modern moment. That's an amazing part of what's happening. I'm generally a pretty easygoing guy, but I do have one huge pet peeve in the health and wellness industry, which is the fact that people spend so much energy on diet fads while ignoring something that's just as bad as junk food, in my opinion. I'm talking about junk light, blue flickering light to be specific. Blue light, meaning any light that looks white at night, trashes your melatonin levels and thus your sleep. But melatonin does way more than help you sleep. Melatonin is the body's most powerful antioxidant, and it's also your most potent endogenous anti-cancer molecule. And light flicker sucks because it can cause neurological issues like headaches, migraines, and even photosensitive epilepsy. And if you want to know if you've got flicker, you can easily test the flicker of your bulbs by shooting a short slow-motion video. If, when you watch it back, the light flashes on and off, you've got flicker. Not good, but fixable. Lucky for us, our homies over at Blue Blocks made some bulbs that only emit red light. So zero blue, green, yellow, or orange light, just pure red, which is optimal for melatonin production, and their bulbs don't flicker. Additionally, the Lumi sleep bulbs do not run on Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, which means very low EMF readings, if any at all. These bulbs are just badass. They did it right. I use them strategically all over our house, mostly in table lamps, since light source positioning is also important. Think of your nighttime lighting as a campfire, warm light at eye level, not overhead, if possible. This is what we've evolved to do. So if you're ready to ditch your blue light, get over to blueblocks.com slash lifestylist and use the coupon code lifestylist to save 15%. That's B-L-U-B-L-O-X dot com slash lifestylist. And the code is also Lifestylist. I find myself oscillating between, and and less so this side than the other side, between this is the end of the world as we know it. Evil is winning. They're going to win. <laughs> and it's only a matter of time before they break my door down and throw me in a camp. You know, I mean, that's like at the worst place that I could go. Thankfully, I don't live there much where i'm intending to live more of the time is a very zoomed out perspective on this absolute perfect drama that creation has provided us this incredible duality there's no other way to Mm -hmm. to phrase it yeah. yeah where 
everything, even the things that I think are wrong and should be different are exactly the way they're supposed to be. And so if, if I lean more into that, that it is a benevolent universe and that it's all good, not spiritual bypass, but really reconciling no, but really that, that yeah. you know, really reconciling that as the ultimate truth that Christ consciousness, call it what you will, pervades and that this is all inclusive of that, even the things that I deem to be wrong, yes. evil, dark, right? The interesting thing about finding that home there is the motivation to still do good. You know, it's like, if none of this matters, and this is all just kind of this game, this chessboard that's been created so that consciousness can experience itself yes. in this vastness of contrast, then why do anything right? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not like well, be a bad person, but just like, God, am I is it worth kind of the fight or the perceived fight that I'm, that I'm putting up? Like maybe, maybe I just live my life and just don't worry about any of this yet, which is kind of more where I lean into. Mm -hmm. But then I find myself having a conversation with someone like you and I have my notes and I'm like, those people watching this video, they need to hear this shit. They need to think like we think, you know I mean? There is, if I'm honest with myself, this savior kind of, although I'm, I'm sure my influence in the world is, you know, minuscule in the great scheme of things, but I'm like, man, if just one person hears this conversation today and they rethink their relationship to their body or to the medical system or to the oppressive governments that are now, you know, imposing upon us, maybe I save that one person. But to your point, who am I to say that that person needs to be needs saved, saving. right? It's right. like, and and are you and worth the, anything the, if you don't save anyone? Right, right, right. Like, yeah, totally. Are Do, you still somebody even? Where does yeah. my value, where's my value derived from, right? But seeing that kid in the mask and saying, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love that perspective. It's There's a great Shakespearean quote that's, I mean, it's just, this is the only spiritual teaching I probably ever need. There's no such thing as good or bad. Only thinking yeah. makes it so, yes. right? So yeah. if everything is really neutral and arbitrary from a non-dual perspective, and where I get caught is when I buy into one side of that polarity. So is the answer not for each individual perhaps that seeks this kind of level of peace and fulfillment in their life to really find that middle path and surrender judgments and surrender positionalities of what they think they know, what's right, what's wrong, and just follow that calling within one's body and within one's spirit as what seems to be the best indication of the best path forward. Yeah. You know, the, the thought, the feeling, the deed of the highest good according, you know, as quick, as close as I can get to that. Yeah. Like what serves the highest good, not, not only for myself, but inclusive of all creation and just yeah, putting one's focus on what I think that is and perhaps fine tuning one's ability to navigate to that line, to that center line of your own truth, your own integrity of, of your own infinite love not your infinite love, but the infinite love. I I went, I think it was... I mean, to me, life gets so much yeah. more fun when I just go zoom exactly. out, zoom out, zoom out. You know, 30,000 feet, not far enough. Well, I don't know if space is totally real, but let's say as far <laughs> go up to the edge of the firmament, you know, Thank or you. whatever it is, right? And just go, oh, I see. And this, ha this has happened to me on a number of occasions, smoking Bufo Toad, 5-MeO-DMT, where it's just like, I mean, I don't want to get into that conversation, but I can look at the dualistic judgments I have about events and people and places and everything that's going on. And like in those moments, it's so clear to me that it's all so perfect. And then it's also just, it's designed with such perfection that it doesn't need my intervention. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Like I've even had experiences, you know, once you come out of it, you're like, wait, was that real? But I mean, even seeing people like a Bill Gates, a Fauci, a Hitler, a Mussolini, a Mao, whoever, and like they are executing their role with absolute perfection that it's almost beautiful. Not that I condone no, of course their, I understand you know, their thing, but they're not wrong. They're supposed to be there. And if you got rid of a Fauci, duality would just go plink and pop another one in there to do their job right? until consciousness by and large is elevated to the point where that extreme, perhaps this is just hypothesis that that extreme expression of duality is no longer necessary for consciousness to then evolve into a higher level. Right. But the only thing that you can control in that entire scenescape is your own experience of your internal world right. and bringing into awareness that which was obscured from your, um, your own consciousness. So those judgments 
that's, you know, that's why when you feel this upset, <laughs> enter through the upset, those judgments are of projections, of parts of you that you don't know how to love yet because you don't understand, right? Like if I, if I have a part of me that says I am selfish, right? I am selfish and I better hide that because I won't be loved if anybody sees it. Then I have another part of me, the, the critic, that makes sure that I keep that selfish part in check so that I preempt anyone else's seeing it. And I want to say, no, don't do that. Why didn't you, why didn't you offer her a ride? You're so selfish. Like that's whatever, that's wrong and bad. But I, I need to understand that I'm going to judge that selfish part in whomever else outside of me until I see what that selfish part actually is doing, why she exists, how she has served me. Maybe I grew up in a household where like it was every woman, every man for themselves. Like, and that was literally the only way I could survive because nobody gave a shit about me, right? And that selfish part is holding all the pain of that, literally for decades. And when I reconnect to that part as valid, offer approval, like Louise Haystyle, if there's anything you can do for yourself that will change your entire life, it is to offer yourself approval and validation for everything you do. Mm, everything you are, that's everything good. you do. Get super, super, not only comfortable with and tolerant of like the ways in which you do stupid things, you're an asshole, you're like mean and cruel and selfish and manipulative and whatever, but actually approve of it. Like offer approval to why you are doing that, to the part of you that can find no other way to feel safe and, and to survive, right? So to like resolve judgment because it's the right thing to do is to bypass this beautiful experience of collecting the pieces of yourself that hold really intense emotions that just want to be felt. And like I said at the beginning, that also hold these gifts, right? These creative impulses that irre irrepressibly come forth when you start to cohere around like the, the bigger dimensional experience of yourself as having, it's like an inner circus, I say, you know, it's like this whole wild thing <laughs> going on in there. You Got know? that right. But I was gonna just propose like two questions too, because we are habituated around struggle. I'll speak for myself. It's a habit of struggle that I have been like generating an awareness of. I went to Naples with some girlfriends for my birthday last year. And it was at a time when it was like super masky still in Miami. And we went to Naples, which is, it's like the partisan PSYOP, right? So Miami's like a blue city and Naples is a, this is, I'm sorry, Florida is a red city. Thank you. I was thinking, I was thinking um, Italy. Yeah, I know, I know, I don't know. I like assume everybody's in a Florida centric <laughs> mind. So, and I went there and no one was wearing a mask no one anywhere. And for me, this was like, what is happening here? This, it was such a different experience. Then the energy was like very laid back and totally chill. And I actually em embarrassingly found that I didn't like it. Like I like didn't like it. Like I, I found myself almost like, well, now I don't know who's on my team. And like, what, it, what's I, because I'd been in this, like the mask thing has been big for me, what it's symbolized. And I'd been in this like struggle against it. And now all of a sudden I was like relaxed and I just couldn't orient. And I, I felt uncomfortable. And obviously when people start to meditate, like often they find that their anxiety is like heightened because calm is associated or harmony or, you know, stable conditions are associated with like danger, right? Like we, we have these mixed associations and couplings, you know, somatic experiencing calls it that from our childhood that need to be un unwound. And so, you know, I think when you talk about being dragged off to like a gulag or whatever, like go into that, spend time like with that what if, like we were saying digitally, like just explore it, like really, really go into the worst, worst case scenario. What is your worst case scenario? Like your kid, you know, your family or woman getting dragged off and what, whatever, what is it? Because it's holding a lot of your energy. The, the avoidance of it is holding a lot of your energy. So explore that worst what if. And then the most interesting work I've done personally is exploring the best case scenario. What if? Do you even know what that is? Right? Like what, 
what actually do you want? Like, well, you don't arrive at that if you're just refreshing Telegram feed. You know if I mean? you're focused like, on the fight, like focused on what you don't want, you know, yeah. it's that it's that thing too. Just metaphysically, it's like putting so much energy in, in what you don't want. I find, I mean, I think part of it is just there's a dopamine addiction to bad news, right, and fear, and you're just like, ah, uh, what else is going wrong? But it's also, you know, the the false sense of security in knowing what's going on. All right, let me see where they're, okay, the truckers in Canada, okay, right. I kind of see where things are. It's like, if I hadn't known anything about any of this the whole time, Imagine. my life would have not changed one <laughs> iota, literally. <laughs> Except maybe I want to go in and get a juice at Air One and they're like, sir, you have to put this thing on, you know, like, <laughs> or an airplane. <laughs> but literally, yeah. other than that, my life is just getting better and better and better all the time. Sure. But because I'm aware of the suffering of so many people and the, the how the oppression is affecting so many people in a in a more quantifiable way than it happens to have affected me. Mm. That's a very, very slippery slope, that anonymous victim. Like the, yeah. It's like, yeah, there's like this, oh, I'm feeling the burden of the collective for all these people suffering, you know, but then to totally just live my best life and be happy. There's like a survivor's guilt thing that happens, right? It's like even saying like, my life's better than ever. And then I think of, ah, oh, fuck, what about those people that lost their job or they had to get the thing or... But you don't know in the totality of their experience what that even represents and to project yourself into their experience and imagine what it would be like for Luke to experience losing his job because he didn't take the jab or whatever. It, it's magical thinking, you know? It's childlike magical <laughs> thinking, really. And so that's why I use, I've used oh, this, I love you, dude. this term so called good. reality tubes, right? Like everybody has their reality tube and everything that happens, this is my belief system, in your reality tube is totally internally consistent with that reality and the dimensional consciousness that your embodiment is representing. So for me, and, and I did this for many years as an activist. So like literally probably abandoning my own children for the anonymous victimized child, obsessively focusing on my role in saving that child, right? It's part of the spiritual bypass technology. It's part of the rescuer victim consciousness to imagine that it is my role to secure a sense of savior energy, secure a sense of righteousness, secure a sense of goodness, secure a sense of worth and validity through serving in this way. When it's literally like an imaginary space. If you know someone, I know, first of all, I, I literally don't know anyone who's vaccinated in my life. That is not in my reality, okay? If you know someone who's being dragged off to a gulag, it's part of your reality. Responding to that is gonna be an important thing for you to sort out how you wanna show up as a warrior, as a fighter, as a defender, as a savior. Like maybe you wanna avoid it, you wanna hide in your closet however you show up to what's happening in your actual three-dimensional reality. So laying claim on our three-dimensional reality is one of the most audacious forms of radical activism you can engage right now because of the metaverse, right? Because of this virtual space, because of social media, because of all of the ways we are in this endless projective labyrinth of unreality. If your real life is showing you pain points, turn towards those. And of course, turn inside, right? To look at what they are inviting you to reclaim and connect to in yourself. If your life is not showing you pain points, stay in your lane, like stay in your life because you have no ability to truly know. And that's sort of the shadow of empathy. I don't know how else to put it. Like when we imagine through projection that we, we, you know, and, and, and call it compassion, that we know what it's like to be in someone else's circumstantial reality and that we're going to help them make it different. Now, if somebody asks you for help, that's one thing. But one of the ways to resolve this like spiritual bypass impulse so many of us have is to actually never offer help that is not requested, right? Don't offer your perspective on life. Don't offer your information like unsolicited to somebody. Would you please tell a lot of people I know that? <laughs> right, no. I mean, it's trust no. me, it's like taking I'm, a lot of I'm, restraint I'm, I'm on my sure part too. I'm sure I used to do that, I, I think, quite a bit. And then, I don't know, somewhere along the line, I kind of learned that lesson. But I, I, it's funny you mention that because right now, one of the things I'm working on myself as I kind of build my social circle here in a new place yeah, and yeah. living somewhere for 30 plus years and kind of just having everything easy in terms of my social life, I find that the thing I struggle with most 
yeah, it's pretty consistent right at the moment. There's something for me to discover or learn about this. Maybe it's just advocating for myself and declining. But I find a lot of people want to constantly teach me things. You know, like yeah. people start giving me like spiritual lessons and telling me how the world works. And I have literally not asked one question. I've basically been doing that for the past two hours. <laughs> No, no, well, but I'm asking you, asking. I'm asking, that's it, there's, see, there's, <laughs> that's the, the difference. it's like an invasive kind of, it's, I think it's just kind of, I don't know, it's an ego positionality or something, right? And I, I think I find it even more difficult to stomach. It's usually been most often men that are considerably younger than I. Mm -hmm. that's interesting. Yeah, where, and it's like, dude, like, I don't, I didn't you don't need to yet. pontificate like, I didn't ask for your worldview or if you ask me like, how you doing? I'm like, oh man, I'm doing good. I'm working on this thing or that thing. Well, here's what you need here's to do. Me. And I'm like, I did not invite you into my house. I'm, you know, metaphorically yeah, speaking, yeah, yeah. I don't know why it's so, it's becoming so triggering and intolerable for me that I think I'm being called probably to just be radically honest and say, hey, I really appreciate your wisdom and that you feel called to share it with me, but I'm, I'm just really not interested. I'm, if I have any questions, I'll let you know. Yeah, you know? that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Um, I do think that that's- And having the top. courage having the courage to gotcha. to possibly lose their good favor or approval, you know, and being in my own, my own integrity in that and speaking the truth in a way that's, you know, hopefully not too abrasive or hurtful. But that really is my truth because I'm sitting there and I'm kind of nodding along and inside I'm like, I got to get the fuck out of here. No, this is so uncomfortable. Right. I feel like I'm being assaulted by someone's ego who wants to- prove themselves to me or to other people listening or whatever and, and become like my teacher. And I'm like, dude, you're 30. Like, get the fuck away from me. Like, not that, I, you know, you, you can learn from children. I learned from my dog, right? But it's like a different type of teaching. It's like some weird... This is I, spiritual ego. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's like a, yeah, it's like, it's like when the ego socially wants to assert itself and position itself in the hierarchy, right? Yeah. And and maybe they see me at a position and they want to like dominate me almost in a way, totally subconsciously. And I, but I'm not playing that game. I'm not trying to be the 51 year old elder that comes in and teaches them. I've already played that game. I grew out of it, hopefully. So I'm just trying to hang out and have a burger, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? I like, Or they have the program <laughs> that they are invisible, worthless, unlovable, unless they can help someone. Oh, yeah. Right. And like, right. if you look at human interactions through the lens of like, everyone is mitigating their pain, everyone is running programs that they are fundamentally worthless and unlovable unless they do exactly what they're doing, right? Which could be avoidance, it could be entering into this like egoic, narcissistic sort of dynamic of I know best. And it takes there are as many expressions as there are individuals. And if we look at it through that lens, then it really, we, we kind of release them to their shit and then you get to sort of say, does this work for me or not? And the only problem arises when you don't stick by your own boundaries, right? Totally. When, when you self-abandon and you self-betray. And that's why I've been so focused on this concept of how we, we resolve that self-betrayal when you feel that little tap of like, I want to get the fuck out of here. And you, you honor that right? You respond to that. You hold space for that being real. That's it, There's yeah. no problem. That's but it. it's like how, if we're appeasers and we have that part that says, okay, if you don't appease, people don't like you, people judge you, it's uncomfortable. You're going to feel rejected. You're going to be alone. You're going to die in, you know, like a corner. And then we have the part that says like our child, our child self, I think we have the part that says, this is how this feels. Do you care? <laughs> you've not seemed to care for most of your life how you feel. This is how this feels. It feels bad, right? This feels bad. And how do we reconcile those two parts? Well, it's usually to compassionately, as you just modeled, like compassionately express a boundary, compassionately say like, this doesn't work for me. Not like a dick, you know, like, and not with energy of a no, which is essentially the same energy of a grasp, but with a sort of like, Hey, dude, like, I'm, I'm good. I got this. Don't worry. I'll let you know if I need you, right? Like, there's a way to express your no and also stay connected that we have not been modeled. Right, right. It's, it's, a, it's a bit of a skill to be honed. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Thank you for traversing that with me. Yeah, it's, like, it's, it's becoming kind of challenging. I think why is because I'm not honoring that part of myself. There's that 
I'm getting fidgety and uncomfortable. And then, you know, I'll try to rationalize it. Well, what? They're just like sharing their gift or whatever. Like just hold space for them. It's like, no, but I didn't. That's fine, but it does not feel, it doesn't feel good. I'm not enjoying this. And like, I just want to, I don't know, I think amongst, I don't know how it is with women because I'm not a woman, but amongst men, there's a a lot of self-awareness that's required to just learn how to hang out and just be equals, you know, and not like jostle for position or to cave underneath to a lower status. You know, it's like just to have true equality, I find men are are often very challenged by. That makes sense. You know, it's just like, I don't want to be in the role of being the wise teacher unless someone asks me that I really enjoy it. You know, I sponsored a lot of people in recovery. Like I played that role out and it benefited me and a lot of other people. But I just want to walk in a room and shoot the shit and like hang out and relax. You know, why do we need to be te- And I think it's it's prevalent here because there are a lot of people in personal development here. A lot yeah. of people are coaches. I mean, Austin is a hub for people that have gifts and philosophies that they want to share, which is beautiful. And I love awake people. But yeah, it's become quite a thing with me and Alice and I talk about it a lot because I come home and I'm like, I'm exhausted. The other day I came home and I was like, because Allison's a real introvert, classical introvert, and I don't think I am or at least wasn't. I came home and I was like, how was it? Did you have fun? I'm like, I'm exhausted. I think I'm turning into an introvert. Like, I just can't. I don't want to sit there and talk to all these people unless we can just be on the level and real and hang out, you know? This doesn't have to be such a production. And then you start to be able to discern whether or not, like as you heal this connection to your inner yes and no, you start to be able to discern whether or not somebody can actually provide you what it is that you want, right? And if they can't, you go elsewhere. So that like so much, I think of what is being clarified for us now on grand skills, like can I go to the medical system to source healing? Is that on offer there, right? Like, can I find and experience the love that I know I need and I know how I experience it through my partner? Is it actually on offer here? What about my mom, you know? Like, can she actually give me this thing that I've been longing for since childhood or whatever? Or is it literally not available? And I know in my bones that at these places, what I want is not available and I'm insisting that it should be. So when that discernment muscle is strengthened, it becomes this sort of like dispassionate navigational system where you say like, I want something, it's not available here, going this direction, right? Right, right, And it's not a condemnation, it's not blame, the whole victim thing is done, drained from the room. And it's it's very freeing and it's freeing into this space of Jungian individuation where we each become our whole integrated selves. We are aware of our personal gifts and we are aware of our vulnerabilities in our shadow realms. And then we can relume the fabric of our togetherness that is really only available when we're not blurring and bleeding into each other. And I mean, like even here, I have had to pay for like an hour. Okay. <laughs> the whole time we've been I was, talking. I was wondering about literally, that. Literally, I'm like, okay, well, maybe there's five more minutes and maybe that's fine. Or maybe I should just get up. But I've never done that before in an interview. And so maybe that would like mess with the flow. Like it's in all of these micro instances. And it's not like I'm going to like beat myself up about this for the rest of the day. But it's an awareness of like, you had to pee an hour ago. You could have said, also because you told me I could, I'm going to go. And there are a hundred rationalizations for why I didn't do that. And then there's an awareness that I blurred us, right? Like I blurred us because I was like, this is what you need or them or what, like, this is what they need. And, and it's better for them. And what does it cost me? That's always my cue. What does it cost me? Like, like you said, with the, that dynamic, like, oh, it's not a big deal. I can just do it. Like, what does it cost me? But I do think we're entering this realm where authenticity and real time realness is the only currency we're going to feel as true you know, and everything else, it's coming so virtualized and so CGI, like our whole dimensional reality that that felt experience of a yes or no, or like, am I here? And what do I want? And what do I feel? Where do I end? And you begin sentiently. It's, it's all we're going to be able to rely on because the rest is so right. captured, right? Like yeah. The, the mirage is really well produced. Yeah. Out of all of the incredible healing tools and gadgets I have around the house, there aren't many that I use every day. 
One brand that consistently makes it into my routine is Higher Dose. I usually start my day on their large infrared PEMF mat, which combines the powerful technology of infrared heat with PEMF for an incredible recharging experience. PEMF, if you don't know, stands for Pulsed Electromagnetic Field, and it works by sending electromagnetic waves through your body at different frequencies to help your body's own recovery process. It's uh, relaxing while energizing at the same time, which is incredible. So I use the smaller mat here in the studio since it fits comfortably in an office chair or on the sofa and the regular size mat for meditating or napping. You can also do yoga on the big one if you were so inclined. And I'm also a longtime infrared sauna user, but they can be both bulky and expensive. So if you don't have the budget or the room for a full-size sauna, the higher dose sauna blanket is a game changer. It's portable and super easy to use and store when you're not using it. You just turn it on, put on some cotton clothing, wrap yourself up like a burrito, and sweat like crazy. The sauna blanket's got an amethyst layer to deepen the benefits of infrared, a tourmaline layer that generates negative ions, a charcoal layer to bind any pollutants that come out of your body, and a clay layer which is balancing for the heat. So this is really cool stuff, and you can snatch yourself your very own infrared sauna blanket or PEMF mat at higherdose.com today. And if you use my exclusive promo code LUKE15 at checkout, you'll save 15% off. That's higherdose.com, D-O-S-E. And the promo code again is LUKE15. It's interesting that you mentioned authenticity Mm -hmm. in terms of the interaction between you and other people, right? When you were talking earlier about how would you, how one of the ways in which you prefer to be um, like the worst accusa- accusation or it could be that right. you said something that's not true, yeah, right? Yeah. right? For me, it's authenticity and like being real. Like I, I am not terribly bothered if somebody thinks I'm ugly, fat, stupid, right. you know, like right, 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 right. call me anything, but call me fake. fake. And I'm um, like, that rubs me the wrong way. But in thinking about those interactions that I described, I have been being yeah. very fake because I'm sitting there yeah. feeling uncomfortable and the authentic response is, you know, I'm feeling a little uncomfortable. I'm going to walk over there, be by myself or talk to another person. But in effort to maintain that approval and not offend someone and all of those things, sitting there and going, oh, interesting. And I'm like, this is not fucking interesting at all to me. So you are being fake. Yeah, exactly. totally. And I'm but like, it's always that yeah, way. The yeah. only reason that I am so concerned about being exposed and honestly not on the public stage in my, in my personal relationships. Like I, I really, for whatever reason, I'm wired not to give a shit about no offense, the anonymous <laughs> like public things does not get like the, disinformation does none of that bothers me. I literally don't care in my personal life. I'm, I can, especially relationships, like super, super sensitive. So the reason that I, I think the being wrong thing is so huge for me is because I literally have been programmed to believe that my feelings and my intuition and even my truth, my personal truth, don't matter and are probably fundamentally mistaken or wrong on some level. Like I can't be, I can't trust myself. Okay. How about that's the summary. I can't trust myself. Mm -hmm. And so what do I do? Because I believe that I can't trust myself. I'm not to be trusted. I come up with all of these reasons to validate and explain why I'm right. So that whole like dog and pony show of like why I am right is itself a betrayal. Like I've left the post of my own heart to defend and validate myself, which I would not need to do at all if I actually believed truly that I am right. Does that make sense? So if I'm so concerned that I'm going to be exposed as wrong, that's a good thing because it's pointing me in the direction of my own belief that I am wrong. Not that I am actually wrong, but it's my belief that I fundamentally am not to be trusted. And I need to heal that inside myself. And the way that I've started to do that is that when I actually feel something, I express how I feel in relationship. I'm talking about like I say, like I feel scared or I feel, that's usually scared, but I feel hurt. You know, I don't like that. This didn't work for me. Like this, I, I, you know, I need to do this. Just super basic sentiments like a kid would say, right? And I leave the 
you know, the litigator's huh. brief, you know, on the side, at least for a little while, because then what I feel is already right. And that's the only thing in the room. I'm not bringing in all the defensive, you know, arguments, which are themselves only evidence that I don't actually believe that what I feel is true and right enough. So I have to prove it. I have to validate it. I have to have all these reasons. And my mind comes online. As we were saying earlier, I stop feeling anyway. So Mm -hmm. it's a self violation. So it's, it's like perfectly designed to like to show us our sensitivities, our fears are perfectly designed to show us how we are our own perpetrators, like how we are actually actively doing this to ourselves already, or we wouldn't be sensitive to that fear. Yeah. It's, uh, it's such a gift to be able to begin to tune into your body yeah. for the yeses and nos. It's not even a no. It's almost like when the body speaks, I'm thinking again in like a situation in which you find yourself to be uncomfortable and cagey. It's not even the feeling of a no. It's just, it's a feeling of a not yes. Because the feeling of a yes is so pronounced, just like, ooh, this feels good. Yeah. When you texted me yesterday, like, hey, I'm in town. There wasn't one second that I was like, eh, I don't know, let me feel into So I was like, yeah. oh, Kelly's in town. Fuck yeah, let's yeah, yeah, go, let's clear. hang out. Yeah, yeah, just boom, it's a yes. Whereas a no for me, I think, and sometimes it may be easier to miss because it's it's not a strong no. It's just like a, it's almost neutral. Yeah. So it's just, it's about kind of determining, exactly. it's like how kinesiology works, right? Yeah. It's like, it's not, there's no yes and no, there or you know a truth and falsehood. There's only truth or not truth, yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. So it's that kind of thing is like listening to the nervous system when the nervous system is like true or yes, feels good, this is love, versus the absence of those feelings would be what I would construe to be a no. Yeah. You know? Right. But even, but even that, the lack of those attributes makes a no feel very uncomfortable in and of itself. And also the nervous system piece is very real, you know, like you can't establish a stable relationship to the embodied, you know, (laughs) yes or, or not yes or whatever. Like you can't establish that unless your neurobiology, in my opinion, your neurobiology stabilized. And that's why I'm a big believer in the Maslow's hierarchy. Like first the lifestyle choices, not only because you you know, declutter so much of the inflammatory signaling and everything else that is rightfully on board because of your wrongful lifestyle choices, but also because choice is our superpower. It is our way out of victim consciousness. And when you start to, I need to tell you this, when you start to recognize the power of your simple daily choices, you're conferred. It's almost like you're like anointed, you know, in, in your adult consciousness. So you are conferred this awareness and and felt experience of like, what I choose makes a difference. And sometimes a really big difference. I changed my breakfast. I changed the time I go to bed. Like I changed the water I'm drinking and I feel different. So my choices matter. Um, I have impact in this sphere. I'm not the child, the helpless, dependent, powerless child. Like I thought that I still was. And then once you do that, then to explore your, you know, dissonant relationships and your secret traumas you've never talked about and to look at the fact that you hate your freaking job or whatever, that becomes so much more available because your nervous system capacity literally can contain states of so-called negative affect with such greater power. It's, it's not available, you know, yeah. just because you want to be able to experience joy and expansion, your nervous system may not be ready for that. And so you, you titrate, that's a somatic experiencing concept too. You titrate into that, you know, you, you work to hold expansive states. You work to hold, for me, a lot of it was like holding grief and shame and sadness without needing to go into my mind immediately or, um, otherwise, you know, fix it. Mm -hmm. I think the many years of, uh, pretty consistent and committed practice to Kundalini yoga helped me a lot with that. And they would talk about that. It's, exactly. like, it's in the teachings it's and I'm kind of like, yeah, whatever. Like I didn't listen to the teachings. I'm just like, I just feel good after class. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm going to just keep doing what feels good. But retroactively, I've seen like, oh man, it, it, specifically even going into some really intense plant medicine and, and psychedelic experiences after having done Kundalini yoga for a few years. I think that was kind of like my gateway into those I agree. experiences. My sadhana practice 
when <clears throat> I started in 2015, after my mentor died suddenly, I started a pre-dawn practice inspired by mm -hmm. my Kundalini teachers at the time. And uh, because of that, I started to go to bed as we were talking about early because I was waking up at five yeah. or, you know, and so yeah. I was like, well, I guess this means I can't stay up till two. And my entire system shifted, like my diurnal rhythm and everything shifted because of that. And my capacity and experience of so-called stress totally changed. Like I felt rewired by that one choice. Mm -hmm. So amazing. And yeah. Amazing. I highly recommend that to people that, you know, can get over the the accoutrement <laughs> you yeah, know, like yeah, people, yeah, exactly. i'd bring like the homies in there and they're like what the hell man i was wearing white and these turbans and the chanting and i'm like i know i know just clock how you feel right now and in 90 minutes check back in you know and, and almost pretty reliably they'd be like yeah it feels good and it wasn't for everyone but to me the the lasting thing was that sort of toning of the nervous system yeah. and being able to just withstand deeper work and not fall apart you know, and Absolutely. specifically in ceremony. I mean, I just yeah. remember like, I can't believe that I'm holding what I'm experiencing mm -hmm. right now, the places I'm going in the depths of my soul and shadow that I can actually be physically present to this and hold this shit. You know, things that I ran from my entire exactly. life, the amount of energy that I had expended just trying to, don't feel yeah, that, exactly. don't feel that, you exactly. know, and then to go bring it all on at once, pull up the dump truck and just let it rip. <laughs> and to be able to actually watch the body just undulate and go, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. We got this. We got this. Still you know, yeah, yeah crazy. Yeah, so yeah. empowering. You know, maybe a lost rite of passage in some cultures mm -hmm. that, that might have been present on a hunt or a, some kind of ceremony or who knows what that I didn't get that I invited into my life later. Yeah. Visiting the edges of what you thought your self concept. Um, yeah was yeah, yeah contained by and breaking through and recognizing you're still yourself it's like that whole die before you die and you never die yes, thing yes exactly. <laughs> you know what i mean exactly. it's built to like walk to through the valley of the shadow of death kind of you know those i mean the real dark nights of the soul not necessarily like a period in your life but those instantaneous ones where you're invited to really be honest with yourself and to explore and and if your body's on board for that it makes it you can get a lot more done yeah and yeah. I mean, in, in Vital Mind Reset, in my program, I have a very secular version of, of these medical meditations, Kundalini meditations. Mm -hmm. There's three minutes. It's three minutes a day. Three. And so, I mean, it it's, can be revolutionary what your nervous system can experience with this dedicated commitment to you know, these practices. I and we'll wrap it up here in a minute because now I'm just going to start shooting the <laughs> shit in less meaningful, perhaps, ways. I was listening to Jordan Peterson on a mm -hmm. podcast a couple of days ago and it, it was like, it was Joe Rogan. It was like four hours, yeah. but like he's just intellectually stimulating enough for me to listen to for that long. And at the very end, he said he's been practicing Kundalini Yoga, he and his wife, for like 18 years every day. Mm -hmm. I was like, what? That, I would not have attributed that practice to that person it was a little bit of a i always enjoy those make me many, yeah matches, very yeah. distant i was like that but he but you know but you know it. yeah I, I i gained a little a little more respect for him i said man that's that's not an easy path uh oh, okay i do have one last question for you and it's actually it's not true i have maybe two maybe three this one's might be hard to answer quickly so mm -hmm. forgive me in advance okay to me and many other people, it's abundantly clear that this thing that they call a disease going around is not what we're being told. I don't pretend to know what's going on. I just know something's fishy and I'm not going along with any of it. Yet, there seem to be a number of people over the past couple of years that have been ill with something. Mm -hmm. The mysterious part about that to me is that the flu and cold don't exist anymore, mm -hmm. which is very suspicious because how did we eradicate the cold and the flu right. all of a sudden? Okay, that's the elephant in the room. But anytime I kind of lean into this idea that like maybe this whole thing, not that there was something made in a lab fabricated, but maybe that the whole thing is fabricated kind of like on the outskirts of the narrative to the point of a David Icke that's like, no, it's just people get sick and this is what it is. It's all these environmental factors and there is actually no virus right but then i'm always well what is there i was sick a couple of years ago it was something that's pretty gnarly i thought it was a bad flu and then i got some blood work done for another reason and they did like an antibody test and it showed up this antibody 
But the thing I still can't get past is this scientific method of inquiry wherein a virus is isolated and you know a, a, a well host is infected and, and they'd see if they can make a spread. Yes. Co- coaches, Co- Coke's Coke's post- postulate, I mean, right? Coke's postulate. Coke's postulate. When I interviewed Dr. Cowan the first yes. time, he he explained all that. Yes. And I was like, okay, cool. I just have such a hard time understanding how so many well-meaning, and I'm assuming scientifically brilliant in some cases, if not educated people, don't acknowledge that that's never happened. Yes. That's the thing I can't, I'm just like, I don't get it. Is it only these fringe weirdo scientists over here that believe in in that postulate Mm -hmm. and therefore everyone just ignores it because it's like outdated and lame Mm. or is that legit? So that's kind of not even the question of more the premise for germ theory versus terrain theory, Mm -hmm. because it seems, and I don't fully even, I haven't formed thoughts about what that means entirely, but if terrain theory is really the predominantly valid theory of how our bodies work and how we interface with our environment, then that would just throw kind of all of that out out the window and none of what we're seeing would be true at all. Mm-hmm. I don't know how to formulate that into a question. Forgive yeah. me. No, I mean, I could, I could talk about this all day. It's such an important, it's arguably the most important aspect of what is happening. And that's why my friends like Tom Cowan and Andy Kaufman and others are so perseverative on this particular point of whether or not a virus has actually ever been any virus. Yeah. Not just this one. Not just this one. Yeah. Um, isolated and shown to be a causal vector of human pathology. If we don't back up enough to that question of literally what makes people sick and to answer that question to an extent that feels scientifically valid, then we are literally throwing sand around in the PSYOP sandbox on all sides, right? Whether right. it's the engineered, you know, bioweapon, whether it's the pharma, you know, I mean, this is this dimension of it as somebody who has abdicated pharmaceuticals entirely, the ivermectin hydroxychloroquine arm of entitlement. It's like the Stockholm syndrome entitlement to, you know, the the abusers <laughs> prized possessions or whether it's believing that there's actually a novel pathogen that's causing excess morbidity and mortality. It's all a mess. Like this is just a silly mess if you don't back up enough and ask the right questions. And I was already, I think, trained around this through psychiatry and the chemical imbalance theory of mental illness and the fortuitous experience I had being exposed to, you know, the work of, you know, Peter Bregan and Joanna Moncrief and David Healy and others before me, Irving Kirsch, who had helped me to disabuse myself of this idea that let's say depression, but it's really any so-called mental illness is caused by chemistry. If I didn't inquire that deeply, I would still be prescribing fish oil and St. John's wort for a depression, you know, <laughs> Yikes! rather, right. Rather than and debating about the, the data that shows that they're just as effective and side effect free rather than the, you know, understanding that I've come to around this invitation that so-called mental illness actually represents to reclaim yourself, right? And to come bring your soul online and to come into this body with mastery and agency. So if we don't ask this question, we can stay in the habit of fighting these smaller fights. Totally. This is like the Democrat Republican thing, right? The whole dichotomy is set up for this to create that, to create the platform wherein, you know, you have a group to identify with or a belief system to identify with. Yeah. Meanwhile, like let's zoom out. The whole thing is bullshit. The whole thing is, <laughs> you know, the is whole thing is a game and it's a like a, ch- a chessboard that's been created, right? And we're like, I'm on, I'm on the black side of the chessboard. That's and it's right. like, oh my God, we're getting so duped. That's right. And so why that's the first thing I'm curious about is have you interrogated your understanding of the so-called immune system? Have you interrogated the history of virology? What do you understand about the evidence that exists or doesn't to prove that contagion is a real thing? 
our understanding of an invisible particle jumping from one person to the other through midair, and including non-modal and animate non-living particles that we call viruses, invading a host, infecting them and causing symptoms and associated morbidity and mortality. Do you know about the evidence base for that? Have you interrogated that, right? Maybe you have. And, you know, there is science to support pretty much anything because it's subjective interpretation, ultimately, that gives meaning and confers, you know, importance to whatever our pre existing belief system is. But the nature of science, as Tom and others have said, is, and, and Stefan Lanka is a very important figure in this, it, it, it is to disprove itself. That's the whole point. Like a good scientist actually endeavors to disprove their outcomes, to find all of the ways that their outcomes may not be valid. And that perpetuates the process of science. Science is a process. It's not a destination. There is no, you know, that has been debunked or the science is settled. That's scientism. That's dogma. And so when you start to recognize the... That's, yeah, because sci- science by its definition can never be settled. Otherwise, oh, it's not science, course. right? It's all in plain sight. Yeah. And that's why, you know, we can't get our panties in a bunch about it because it's just... It pisses me off, though, I have to admit. <laughs> like, I want to... F- there's a part of me that wants to fight it and just run around and slap people. Like, wake up, you know? I know. And, and you should... We are here to speak our yeah. truth and represent yeah. that. Don't Don't hide from that. And to recognize, as I have... Because this is all available information, right? And and this is, I wrote a whole ebook with colleagues about how, you know, the the AIDS so-called epidemic was the forerunner, all the same players, all the same scientific um, aspects and public and social propaganda. Literally, that was the rehearsal. Now we're in the actual, you know, play. It's it's exactly the same. So it's been available to you know anyone who's interested to learn that there is more to the whole like virus causes or, or even bacteria causes illness story than we've been told and then ser- and that serves the agenda and serves the pharmaceutical industry and serves the biopolitical control mechanism that is infectious disease and has been you know at least since world war 2 if not before you know this idea of pandemics has been potentially operationalized to control segments of society that are deemed undesirable, you know, for maybe since the inception of, of, you know, um, social structures. I don't know. However, the information is out there. So why don't people know that a virus has never been isolated or shown to cause illness? Why, Why don't they know that? Why isn't that out there? It's not known and it's not embraced because of what it would mean to let go of the concept of infectious illness, the concept of microbiology, the concept of virology and associated germ theory, what it would mean to let go of that means that you, that the entire um, house of cards of allopathy falls. It's a very big thing. You're like, right? It, I think that's why it's too hard for most people to grasp because it's it's like it's like the flat Earth versus yeah, sphere Earth exactly. thing, right? It's like. It's the cognitive dissonance of having to stretch your mind around the idea that tens upon, I mean, in the case of the shape of the earth, it's even more, but let's just say like germ theory, I don't know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of intelligent, well-meaning people got it wrong, like, or, or, and many of them intentionally perhaps, right? It's like, how do you even hold that? (laughs) Because then your whole worldview begins to crumble. If they lied about that, yes. what else are they lying about, right? Yes. Which was like 9-11 was my big red pill back in the day. Yes. You know, that's when I was like, wait, what happened? Show me that video. Rewind that. Wait, what? There's no plane at the Pentagon? Exactly. Wait, then this whole thing is fake. Luckily for me, I, I think I had the moral courage to face that and continue to do so, but I'm sure And for- it's part of coming home. It's part of coming home to your locus of control as within you, right? Like it's part of understanding my senses, my experience of reality. That is my truth. I will not abandon that in service of a dogma that tells me otherwise, right? Whether it's, you know, looking at heavenly bodies, like spinning around us and being told that we're the ones spinning around it, you know, or whether it's seeing that my daughter, I, you know, I drink from my daughter's cup when she's got snot running down her face and somehow I don't get sick. But, oh, it, I'm sure that germs still cause disease most of the time, but sometimes not. And no more questions, <laughs> please. You know, that cognitive dissonance, That's it's good. a part of the mechanism of the PSYOP, right? It's a part of this. I mean, if if these 
controllers, if you will, are anything. They are psychological masters. Masters. They have a grasp on the inner dimensions of our psyches that we can only aspire to in this in this lifetime. I'm working on it, you know, but it's it's all perfectly woven for a grid of control that is elective, that is consensual. No one is being forced to do anything here. That's not my belief system. We consent to it through many ways, like Amazon and our smartphones and, you know, entitlements. Putting on a mask, you know, it's like you see these uh, messages about stop, you know, forcing kids to put on masks in school. And it's like, a, no one's like physically forcing no them, probably in most that. cases. Right. The parents are allowing it to happen. Yes. You know? And you have a choice. And it's right. whenever we feel that we don't have a choice that we are in the illusion of victim consciousness. We always do. Even if it's just how we're narrating the situation, we retain that control. It's part of being, you know, in this in this human body. So, however, what I want to say is part of I think what helps folks think about think beyond germ theory, right? So I, I no longer believe that nature causes illness, period. I don't believe it. So that includes microbes, that includes whatever we're calling parasites, that includes everything. So, so if I don't believe that, and I don't believe in contagion, and you can sneeze and cough all over me, and it may be, okay, gross and contamination <laughs> by germs are two different things. It could still be gross, but it doesn't mean that I'm worried. So I live my life. I do not worry about catching anything from anybody. I actually don't worry about getting sick, period, including things like cancer or whatever, because why? Because I have a new paradigm. So when you are robbed of one paradigm and there's not a net to catch you, that's actually like an act of aggression, you know, that you might impose on someone. That's like insisting that somebody look deeply into their sexual abuse history when they don't have a spiritual framework of, you know, like for me, I believe we we incarnate, we choose our parents and we we choose our traumas and we work with them in order to have certain experiences of contrast that we actually came here to have. That spiritual worldview helps me to understand and contextualize suffering that otherwise might blow me into a million bits to revisit, right? So if you're going to move beyond the germ theory paradigm, then what's going to catch you? What's going to hold your understanding of why do people get sick? Are people actually getting sick in a new way in the past couple of years, right? And what's causing it? Do we even know? Do we need to know? Like, what is the new framework? So there are in my estimation, this is how I talk to my kids about it. Like a lot of, and intuitively, like when you ask children, they, they have a lot of native ideas about what causes illness. Right. And so I talked to them about a couple of different frameworks, right? Like nutritional deficiency, right. Cause I was taught about something called Keshen's disease by my mentor. And it was like this cardiomyopathy that was like sweeping through a part of, um, China. Right. And it was assumed that it was call, caused by some Coxsackie virus, like an infectious agent. And the vaccine was on the way. And then through some sort of like epidemiologic investigation, it was found to, it was like questioned whether or not it was actually infectious or potentially nutritional. And they found that the only people who experienced this so called infectious illness were those who were in selenium depleted soil regions, like regions with selenium depleted soil, replace the micronutrient and all was well. And there are infinite examples of, not infinite, but there are many, many, many examples of what we once thought was infectious. We now understand to be a discrete nutrient deficiency. And all of that is to say that we assume that when there is a co-located phenomenon of so-called pathology, that it's spreading now because of how we've been enculturated. But we don't assume that there is an experience of environmental co-exposure, whether that is, again, nutritional and food supply related or environmentally sort of like induced, or whether it's, you know, toxic exposures, whether it's radiation or, you know, some sort of the water supply or some sort of environmental exposure that is non-natural, that is toxicant. There is toxic rather than toxicant related. And so this co-exposure model to me was like really brought home personally because I went to um, Cartagena with some girlfriends. When was it? Right before the pandemic started. So January, 2019. And there were seven of us and we went 
we had a great time and we flew back and five of us on arrival, including myself, got so sick in a way I have never been sick before. Now, I was like literally eating McDonald's and <laughs> Snickers and Twizzlers my whole adult life. And I never got sick. I never have taken a sick day in my life ever. And I was not healthy. So it's also important to recognize that you can paradigm shift out of this idea that sickness is bad, right? Or that sickness is a problem, meaning acute illness. And you can step into the paradigm that it's a detox strategy because what do we do when we're sick? We sweat, we snot, we diarrhea, you know, we throw up, we, you know, as Tom and others would say, we liquefy, you know, our, our water and we eliminate toxins. That's how we do it. So it's an up-leveling, it's an upgrade, it's a detox. It's a, it's a, there's a way you can reframe these symptoms as being essential. And my worldview is the body doesn't make mistakes. So whatever my body is doing, it's doing and is doing because it needs to be doing. And I don't need to take a hundred supplements or whatever. I can support it, not fight with what's happening. Right. So anyway, we all get super sick and again, sick in kind of a weird way, because normally a cough is productive, like I just said. And I had like this dry cough that I've only ever associated with like radiation pneumonitis from my medical school training and sort of like strange to me. Right. And five of us got sick, two didn't. We all have kids and partners and community and we're interacting and it was like a whole week long thing. Not one person in our communities or our children got sick. Not one. That's probably 75 people or so. After you came back, Mm -hmm. you mean? So the five of us are sick in bed. You guys are supposed to be vectors for disease and be, you know. And this disease, whatever this disease is, right? If you want to look at like the anosmia or the dry cough. I mean, honestly, the characterization of this is like morphed and to the convenience of the agenda. So it's like a silly thing to think of it as like discreet or new as described. And yet people are having experiences, many that seem somewhat novel in symptom profiles. I'm not going to de- deny that. I don't know. I mean, if, if people feel like they're having new kinds of illnesses, then maybe they are. But that doesn't mean that there is an invisible pathogenic vector that's been identified and, and showed to be causal and not even, not even remotely close, like literally not the first step of that scientific process has been engaged. So maybe all we know is that something is going on. And the more logical explanation is that it's a co-exposure. And that little example I just showed, I would only dismiss if I choose to outsource my truth and reality of what health and, and medicine is to be understood as to some authorities that say, well, obviously it's infectious. That's a, that's an infection. That's the flu that you had and it's spread from person to person. Well, why didn't it? So any exception to these dogmatic rules deserves investigation, right? Because it's not true. If it's not true in this one instance, then it's not true, period. So there is an evolved model of the truth that is required to contain these aberrant phenomena, right? So there's the exposure to environmental toxins. There's nutrient deficiencies. And there, there is an incredible amount of research on the nocebo effect and the psychology of fear and the ways in which we literally, it's the bone pointing of, you know, indigenous people, like it, the ways in which we literally make ourselves sick through the belief that we are or will be. That is not fairy tale psychology. I mean, I've, I've written tremendous amounts of material on the nocebo effect. It is more real than many pharm- pharmacologic interventions. One of my favorite, I'll just quickly tell this study, one of my favorite studies is on Prozac, right? And it's these, these, this cohort of people who have been treated to remission on Prozac, right, for their depression. And they are told that they're randomized into two groups. They're either going to continue their Prozac or they're going to be discontinued. And because of the, the fear, the nocebo effect of being discontinued, both groups suddenly experienced symptomatic, statistically significant depression, including Sally, who was taking her blessed 40 milligrams on Wednesday, entered into randomization on Thursday, still took it on Thursday. And now she's, you know, let's say by the following week, feeling acutely depressed. How do you explain that? If not that her belief Hmm. and fear that she would be robbed of her life-saving, life-giving pharmaceutical overrides the actual mechanical, anatomical, pharmacologic effect of that substance. Okay. So 
to me, one of the most compelling frameworks that I was introduced to, I don't know, maybe four years ago or so, is German New Medicine. Right. And it's, I don't know if you know much about it. It's <laughs> Melissa Sell is a colleague of mine who has really like brought it into vivification for me. But it's, I don't want to like represent myself as some ambassador or even particularly knowledgeable, although I do want to point people in the direction of, of her work. And, um, and this, it's a very German approach, but this, this approach to understanding that there are psychic origins. So your perception, okay, that's what I mean by psychic origins that translate into biological programs that are there for a reason, for adaptation purposes, that then result in, at the moment of their reversal, re result in healing symptoms. So through this model, when you have symptoms, the crisis is already completed, finished, metabolized psychologically, like everything, the body's already adapt adapting. And the symptoms are just like the healing phase. By the time you see the symptoms. Oh, interesting. And that applies to cancer, that applies to <clears throat> infection. And this model, in this model, there's no such thing as metastasis. There's no such thing as contagion. And it's not just like an idea. Like the guy who created this model basically, you know, I think there's like 40,000 CAT scans or something that he did to identify the, the brain-based locus of every single one of these conflicts and how they translate biologically. And it's like, for example, like if if my daughter has symptoms of like a urinary tract infection and I'm like, oh, well, she must have E. coli that are invading and infecting her. I don't even remember how I used to believe. Anyway, and through the German New Medicine model, she had a, com a territorial conflict, right? So something, so I'm I'm divorced, I've moved a lot, right? So something happened where she wasn't sure what her territory was. And then, you know, I helped her understand, okay, we moved and everything's cool and you're good and you're safe or whatever. And then the ways in which her, literally her urethra effaced to allow more urine to come through to mark her territory. This is an animalistic biological program here for our survival and adaptation to crisis, perceived crisis, okay, or shock starts to heal. And what helps with the healing? The saprophytes, the microbes that shape shift pleomorphically, like that, that become all different kinds of microbes. So it's not this idea that there's only this bacteria that is never this, that is never a fungus. That, so there, there are, there's many, many decades of research into this idea that we have these almost spores, right? That shape shift as needed to help our bodies restructure. So imagine reframing our whole understanding of microbiology as these agents are there to help us, literally. And they are never there pathologically. They are never there to invade and harm us. It's not even a thing. And that's not to say that there aren't complicated phases of healing where you're, you've basically been in you know, this, this adaptation stage for so long that you're it's not going to work out for you. Right? Like you didn't help yourself enough and you're ready to expire. Okay. So like, it's not to say that there's no such, you know, sort of like bystander effect of the candida or the, you know, the pertussis or whatever being a part of the process that wasn't able to correct ultimately. But it is to say that they are not causal. And that paradigm shift is, is massive. So in this model, let's say there are E. coli there. And if you went in and you looked, you might find them, but they're there to help with the restructuring of the urethra back to its normal diameter, for example, as the conflict has resolved. And that's just one example. There's hundreds of examples of explanations. You can go to learninggnm.com and you can find like all sorts of understandings of any symptoms that you have or any diagnosis that you have through a completely different lens that is ultimately extraordinarily empowering and fear-releasing. Because it's all like, not only is there nothing to worry about, but your body is already taking care of it. And by the time you know about it, like all you have to do is support what's already underway, right? And so, you know, when you have these different ways of looking at symptoms, looking at illness, looking at what's happening, you start to see like, why did I ever think it was that? That's like the least logical explanation <laughs> about what's happening. And then, you know, you have people like, Stefan Longo, who did this, these cell culture experiments recently that I think are very important. And they've been done before him and he's replicating them. And it's basically looking at this idea that what we are calling in cell culture, virus-based 
you know, virus-based um, pathogenic effects is actually the, the, what he calls the cytopathic effect. It's actually the effect of all the shit that is applied to these cultures, antibiotics and their nutrient depleted and all these other factors that are applied that necessarily cause this toxic extrusion from, you know, the cell culture that necessarily cause this effect. So that's called a control, right? When you, when you do the same thing with the infect, the, with the snot, like with the infectious material, and then you do the same thing without it and you have the same effect, how, why would you ever say it was because of a so-called germ, right? So this I think it's compelling. And I also feel for people who are like going like him, who are going back into the fray, trying to disprove and trying to say like, no, it was never done right. You, can't, I don't think we're going to find redemption through the institutions, right? Like we, it's like that Bucky Fuller quote, like we're not, you can't fight the existing reality. You just make your new one, obviate the relevance of this and just get going on what makes sense to you and focus on that. So I don't know how much effort it's worth. Like if I tell you, I meet you at a cocktail party and I'm like, you know, what's really crazy. Has anyone ever told you that like maybe contagion isn't what we think it is. <laughs> and somebody might be like, Oh my God, are you serious? I've always wondered that because like, you know, I was around my sister when she had the flu and I was like, totally fine. Or like, you know, the Cartagena story. I tell and they, they feel expanded by this possibility to make sense out of something they've always known to be true, which is there's more to the story than this whole contagion thing and being afraid of other people's bodies thing. It's just not right, right? Like it's something that's not like adding up there. Then there's all these resources and Andy Kaufman presentations or whatever to support that understanding. And that's great. That's why I've written books. It's just to support the intuition of people who already grok, right? But if you're told that and you're, and you're triggered and afraid and offended, probably you should stay in your worldview. And it is it does not serve you or my energy to bring you like reams of evidence and my 50 page ebook on AIDS and COVID to take that from you. So that's why I just, I'm not sure. I'm glad that, you know, Stefan Lanka is doing these experiments and I'm glad that people are doing, you know, this sort of like myth busting. And I think we're like in this real moment where, where you just like touch on something. And if it's a, if it's a yes, like, amazing. This whole new dimension expands. But if you touch on it and you want to like fight and scream and you get all triggered and upset and just stay where you are, right? <laughs> like, I don't know. I mean, it's kind of like simple. In yeah. There. Yeah, it is. Wow. I always wonder, like yeah. my thing about our colleagues is like, especially the ones who are still talking about COVID cases as if that is they don't know about the test, like as if they don't know about the test fraud and, and carry Mullis and they don't know about PCR and and they're still talking about more or fewer cases or more cases after the vaccine or less, like all this, they're in that data mill playing the, the, the game of COVID is real and the cases are identified through some real mechanism and the virus exists and it's been shown to be distinct and novel, whatever. All of these assumptions, sometimes they're so intelligent sometimes that I'm like, but has anyone ever said, has anyone ever shown them or discussed with them like this concept of Koch's postulates and not even to say that Koch's postulates is some like dogmatic truth, but it's just this, this logical concept that you, you need to be able to take this pathogen from a sick person, put it in a healthy person. They need to get sick themselves in the same way. And the pathogen needs to always be in the sick person and never in the healthy person. That's rational. That's logical. And then there's a scientific method that's very elegant to support that. And it's just not been exercised. Right. So I always wonder, like, do they know that? And I always feel this compulsion. I like, I always, that's why I asked you the question, you know, because I always wonder it too. And also getting, even yes, yesterday I was uh, watching a video of someone talking about this and a really intelligent guy, a leader in this space. And he's talking about the number of cases and the number yeah, of deaths. And I'm sitting exactly. there going, yeah, but the cases are like, that's not valid data, nor are deaths. There's all kinds of shenanigans going around that both of those, right? And so either he's playing the game and he wants to speak their language and play the game on with their rules and their arena, their, you know, tools, like, or, or he just doesn't know and he's never been exposed to it. Because when, in my early years of vaccine activism, I was a total germ theorist and I talked about things, you know, 
that are like risks like SV40 and whatever risks that are germ theory based risks of vaccines. If that makes sense, right? So like I was like fighting against vaccination using their rubric and their playbook unconsciously. I just didn't know. I never had been exposed to this, you know, sort of level of inquiry around germ theory. And so that made sense to me. So I was in the camp of like perpetuating that without knowing that there was another framework to step right. into. However, I wonder if sometimes people know and then they're playing the game, you know, because they think it's the root and they think this is too radical. I mean, I've been uninvited yeah. to like many a speaking <laughs> event and conference because of this particular topic. Like it's too radical to suggest that. It's too long of a stretch for people to, I, you know, where I'm at with all this stuff and it's just the not knowing kind of keeps things interesting. Totally. You know what I mean? Like the the big one again is like the flat earth versus round earth. And I'm not like a flat earther. I'm also not a round earther. Like, have I been to space? No. And what if it's both? And what if it's everything all at the same time? Like if the, if our, I like to get clear, I know my best friend is like very agnostic about a I, lot of things. But, <laughs> it's like a little like destabilizing. But like, me. listen, like I'm looking at Allison's lovely book here. I'm looking at you and this, and, and I perceive this to be like yes. solid matter. Yeah. It's not that from another perspective, 100%. right? Yes. Subatomic, quantum, it's none of this is what it's I think it is. So yeah. like, who am I to say this thing that we all appear to be sitting on right now is one way or the other? It, maybe it's all, maybe it's always, and maybe no one really knows what it is. Yes. And that's you why know? I've become very, very deeply interested in, in deception, right? And the role of deception in our abandonment of our own perception. And I focus mostly on what I'm certain is not true, <laughs> right? right? I'm certain is not true. Right. And that's pretty much everything I've ever learned. Like literally, <laughs> totally. it's pretty much everything. And, totally. I, and I, you know, I, I know a little thing about health and medicine, but as I venture into these other, you know, cosmology and history and finance and education, you know, I'm, I'm in, I'm a novice, like swimming around in these deep waters. And I still find the same patterns again and again and again of the, dis who is in control of the dissemination dissemination of information, why they might've done it the way that they did to what end and how it served to cause this rift between us and our experience between me and my experience of my inner compass. And it's, it's the same damn story again and again and again. So I'm interested in exposing to myself and whoever is interested in listening, like what I am certain is not true. Like to my mind, every media making event in you know, media making history, like TV and, you know, radio and that kind of thing is a false flag. That's how extreme I have come <laughs> to believe. Because I, I, I because understand. if you under, if you need to yeah. believe that media is there to disseminate information to the masses, that sounds crazy. And that sounds like conspiracy theory on steroids. However, if you reframe the understanding of what media is, what it was created for, that's the only perspective that makes any sense. So it's, it's like when you zoom out to, it's like when you see that you're in a theater watching a movie, it's not like devastating and crushing and oh my God, the cabals. It's like, oh my God, I'm watching a movie. I've been watching a movie this whole time. I can just get up and walk out the door, watch another movie. And it's liberating. Like now, like I watched a video recently that Tom Cowan did on um, cells, cell biology. And he basically says, he makes a compelling argument for how maybe cell structures are like a total life. Maybe there's not even such a thing as a cell. <laughs> Literally. Okay. I went to medical school. I dissected human bodies. I stained cells. I like had a job in college where I like cut up rat brains and stained these neurons. And like, I've been in the cell based theory of human anatomy. I even referenced it a little bit ago about liver cells and eyeball cells and whatever. And at this point, it's exciting and fun to me to like touch on the things that I could have been totally wrong about because it expands into that unknown. I can hold that. That's fun for me at this point. It's not devastating, but at an, at an earlier stage in my personal trauma work, it would have been, first of all, I couldn't even have perceived the opportunity to engage the dissonance. And then it would have been, again, robbing me of something emotionally and psychologically to abdicate the understanding I had earned 
you know, or participated in and what it represents to have related to the authorities that handed it down to me in an, in this idealized projection. Sure. Right. So once you, you, you do your mommy and daddy work and, and yeah. you understand that the bad mommy and the bad daddy are within you and you heal your relationship to those parts and you stop needing other people to give you the love that your mommy and daddy didn't give you, then you just, everything becomes sort of like this, it becomes a game, like a fun game. I don't know. And, and, and it's, it's really drained of all that charge. Thank you for, thank you for draining the charge for us, Kelly. <laughs> I got one more question for okay. you. It's from a listener. And I often, I often like will post on Instagram, like, okay. hey, I'm interviewing so-and-so. And I feel bad because I never get to them. Um, <laughs> it's rhetorical. Yeah, yeah. So there, there were two, but I think this one, the first one we've covered, which is, yeah. Anyway, this one is, what advice would you give to your 30-year-old self? Oh my God, my 30-year-old self. <clears throat> I love that question. So that was before my awakening process began, you know, because I'm like only probably 12 years. I've, I've, I don't even know who this guy is, George Adair, but I love this quote, everything you've ever wanted is on the other side of fear. And I have found it to be true again and again and again and again. And, you know, I've had, I'm sure you've had people tell you this too. Like I've had people be like, oh, you're so courageous. Thank you for speaking out in the world and doing what you do. And that is not <laughs> how I experience myself. I do this because I enjoy it. I need to do this. I enjoy this. Like it's a catharsis for me. This does not require any courage at all. Literally none. Mm -hmm. I experience my courage. And it's funny because I was talking to uh, my girlfriend Tara about this the other day. Like I have this like inner like ledger keeper, right? It's like this is part of me that wants credit so badly for my spiritual work, right? I like, if you want me to feel your love, respect and appreciation, you'll, you'll tell me like, Kelly, wow, I really see you've been doing a lot of work. Huh. Okay. That's it. Not about my yeah. books or like, that's what you'll say to me. And it's because the, the courage that I have experienced myself as exercising has been in these moments where I feel terrified of like psychic and emotional obliteration, abandonment, like irreversible rejection and betrayal, loss. And I go forward <laughs> into it. I move towards oh. it. I have that conversation. I, you know, I, I show up um, vulnerable and I, you know, I ask my daughter, what the hell am I doing wrong? You know, like that kind of stuff. Like that is when I experience how much stronger I am than I thought I was. And I experience sometimes the confirmation of what I was most afraid of. Like somebody really isn't there for me or they really can't love me or they really don't like me or want to be with or whatever it is. And I somehow am okay anyway. And, and my experience of reality and my experience of myself like grows to and expands to um, hold this new self-concept. And so I would say like all of these things, all of these secrets, all of these aspects of yourself, you feel you need to hide. They will be exposed. They will be seen. And it's going to be more than okay. Like that there is an, an experience of liberation on the other end of relinquishing that habit of hiding that is going to be literally like delightful. And then it becomes like this way of being in the world where it's actually, like I said, like it's exciting, just like it's exciting for me to experience like the, 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 the moment of awakening from deception. It's exciting for me to make contact with like, you know, these, these parts of me that I thought were like so heinously shameful that I had to hide them literally from my own self, let alone everybody else. And I think also that like, I mean, I look at pictures of myself when I was like 30. I don't know if you have this experience. I don't know what you looked like then. I, I find myself to be more attractive, like energetically and literally physically now than I was then. And I like myself more now. I find myself like more dimensionally like rich and complex and interesting. Like, and 
there are so many more people who don't like me in the world now than there were then. And like, you know, I'm still healing dynamics with my family of origin and I'm still trying to understand like, you know, who's, who are my ride or dies and like, who am I in the world? And what is, it's, it's not like I have any like clarity or certainty or like anything's been concretized. It's just this like experience of my soul coming into my body. Like my soul is safer now in my body than my soul ever was. And that there's evidence, there's like little breadcrumbs of evidence that I'm moving in the right direction. Because I think that when you get to this place where you, you, you trust your fundamental relationship to yourself, you know, you're going to tell the dude, like, listen, listen, brother, like I'm good. I'm good, I'm good on this <laughs> advice. Or I'm going to tell you, listen, Luca, I got a piece so bad, you know, yeah. or whatever. Like you, you heal that dynamic. You, you start to recognize that as you meet your own needs, as you show up for yourself loyally, and you say yes to all of these like weird and wacky ways that you like impulse through into life, then that gets mirrored. It's just like the breadcrumbs start to like, like I said, the arrows stop coming. Like it starts to sort of feel like, oh, wow, this feels better. This is more interesting. It feels more safe, feels more okay. And so I think that's the paradox. Like as you meet your own needs, as you show up for yourself, as you learn how to love yourself, like you get that more from the outside. The world becomes safer. My experience of the pandemic now versus two years ago, it's like night and day. I didn't even, it's like I can barely care what's in the news stream anymore. And it was like, I was living in a world where I was going to be hauled off to a gulag. Like at any moment, my children are going to be forced vaccinated in front of my face. Like, you know, and now I don't need to live in that world probably because that inner tyrant is projected less onto the outer tyrants, right? Like I've, yeah. I've learned to understand it's that. It's part that's of your me. cloak of invisibility. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I think there's something really to be said for that in terms of how this thing affects us or not and how much we interface with it is really knowing truly that you're unfuckwithable yeah and that like no harm can come to you even if harm did come to your physical body per se or Mm -hmm. you know your quality of life but like who you really are what you really are is impervious to attack yeah and yeah you always have choice yeah yes hot damn sister (laughs) this was a monster this was a beast of a conversation to your credit so thank you so much for (laughs) making the time man i just love you you're just so cool funny, brilliant. The conversations we've had before have just always left me feeling really charged and hopeful and informed. And you're just awesome. Thank you for I being love, who you no, are. It's such a pleasure. And, and like yeah. I said, I mean, it must be that uh, a soul family thing because it's just so, it's such a familiar energy. It's like yeah. it's really wild. Yeah, likewise. Beautiful. Well, thanks. And I'll see you tonight for dinner. All right. <laughs> wow. What a bombshell of an episode. As promised. This might just be one that I have to go back and listen to. There are times as the host of this show and these conversations that I I miss a lot along the way. I'm sitting there, you know, looking at my notes and trying to manage and lead the interaction and make sure that we cover what I feel like we need to cover. And I think this one just presented itself with so many thought-provoking ideas that beg inquiry and perhaps further exploration. So if you made it to the end of the show, I think it was a three-hour interview, one of my longest ever, uh, I commend you for your dedication to learning and to opening your mind and spirit to new ideas or maybe even just reinforcing some of the ideas you already held. I think having a malleable mind is important. You know, That's where we find the discernment to take what works for us and leave the rest. And in conversations like this that cover topics that can be polarizing and somewhat triggering for a certain sect of people, I think that's really important, you know, to just sort of let go of our presumptions and preconceived ideas and be open to new ideas and see what sticks, you know. I think most of the topics we covered in this conversation were in alignment with my perspective. And of course, it's always easier to interview someone you totally agree with. But there were still some things we discussed that I'm going to have to go back and ponder. So thank you so much for joining me. If you feel like this conversation could benefit someone you know, I highly encourage you to share it with them. 
For those of you that want to take this episode a bit further, show notes can be found at lukestory.com slash kelly. And there you will also find a link to the complete written transcripts for every damn word spoken during this interview. So if you want to study up a bit and go back and re-examine some of the topics covered, that's how you can do it. And as a reminder, I'm not sure how long social media channels are going to stay relevant and accessible to people like me and Kelly. So for now, I think many of us have found what we perceive to be at least at this time a safe haven over at Telegram. You can join my Telegram channel at lukestory.com slash Telegram. And uh, we're going to be there as long as we can. Now, I'm still on Instagram at Luke Story and a couple Facebook pages and a YouTube channel and of course this podcast. But I think it's wise to diversify and get yourself integrated into as many platforms as you can because you just never know when you might talk about something that's not allowed. Now, who decides what's allowed and what's not? That, my friends, is the problem. (laughs) So for now, you can find the most risque and most likely to be censored content on my Telegram channel. For those of you that want a direct line from me to you, the best thing to do is to join my weekly newsletter. You can find that at lukestory.com slash newsletter. And on the note of the newsletter, I want you to know that I'm very respectful and I send out as few emails as possible. Why? Because I can't stand getting a bunch of spam emails from newsletters I forgot I subscribed to. So uh, I'm very respectful with the newsletter and do my best to essentially just send you releases of podcasts and videos and things like that. So that will, for the most part, just be every Tuesday when this show comes out. That's lukestory.com slash newsletter. Okay, now if today's show felt a bit heavy to you, next week's episode is definitely going to lighten things up. That's number 405. It's called Master Your Sleep, Master Your Life. Top Tools and Power Practices with Todd and Tara Youngblood. Those are the folks from ChiliPad or Chili Technology. You've probably heard me talk about that. Uh, incredible thing that cools your bed and helps you sleep. So next week's show is all focused on sleep, which I think, you know, even based on this conversation is probably more important now than ever. Uh, I swear, good sleep for me is just the absolute supreme uh, cure for anything that ails me, including the stresses of being in the world right now and trying to navigate it. So the next week's show, number 405, is a really important episode for me and one that I felt very passionate about sharing with you. I know sleep is kind of a boring biohack, you know, it's like sleep, that's all you got. But honestly, that is a huge priority in my life and has been for many years. I I wish I would have prioritized that earlier in life now, the ripe old age of 51. And man, if I don't get good sleep, I am tweaked. I used to be able to get away with it. You know, in my 20s, 30s, sleep, meh, take some supplements, have a bunch of coffee, keep it moving. Uh, Now it's just not that way. And it's also one of the ways that I manage stress. I got a stressful life right now. The past year has been nuts, not only for uh, the world, but just in my own personal experience. So that's next week's episode. And if you don't subscribe to this show, you might miss it. If you open your podcast app, on which you're likely hearing my voice right now, you'll see a button somewhere on there that says uh, subscribe. If you click that, then every episode of the Lifestylist podcast will be magically downloaded to your phone device or computer so i highly recommend that you do that Uh, that way you won't miss any shows i know you guys miss shows sometimes because i'll get a message from someone on social media that's like hey what happened to this episode and i'm like it's there refresh your app or subscribe and they go back and then the episode that they thought was gone is in fact there so there's a little podcast app hack for you. The last thing I want to tell you about is that I'll be speaking at Paleo FX April 29th through May 1st here in lovely Austin, Texas. I hope to see you there. You can get tickets for that event at lukestory.com slash events. God, I feel like I just gave you guys a million uh, links. I hate it when I do that. I try to like limit the number of links that I mentioned during each episode, but Sometimes there's just too damn many. So if you want all the links that I just talked about, you can find them easily. I'm going to give you one more. You can always find all of them at the show notes, and that's lukestory.com slash Kelly. All right, share this episode with a friend if you feel called, and I will be back next week to help you master your sleep. Bye.